deliver their speech with much ease. I hope the success will continue for today. Today there is only one technical session which is about to start at 10.30 am and it will continue up to 1.30 pm. In this session there are seven distinguished speakers who will present their paper. There is a lunch break of one hour starting from 1.30 pm. After that there is a three session start from 2.30 pm and it will culminate at 4 pm. Now over to the chairperson who will start the technical session first of today's session. Okay, I wish chairperson Dr. Indranath Mishra sir and co chairperson Mustafa Kaman Ansari sir to start the positive. And the positive is Dr. Gopal Gopal. Gopal Gopal. Gopal Professor N. K. Shah is former Vice Chancellor B. Kumar Singh University, Ara. He has been Professor and Head Department of Botany, TNB College, Bhagalpur. He has also served in the capacity of Professor and Head School of Biotechnology, Rajiv Gandhi Technological University, Bhopal. He is currently research in uh, intestinal molecular cancer therapeutics and natural drugs. He has produced four PhD, has around 50 research articles published in noted national and international journals. Now I request Dr. Shah, Mr. Shah to then. आता ये गुंजे के सी शर्मों में नमन करते हुए मैं सभी श्रोताओं और दर्शकों को इस्तात करता हूँ। मंजे को क्या पसंद? इसके फेस इतने सुनी भी हम इस्ताय। इस ऑन वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट सब्जेक्ट्स दैट इंटर वर्ल्ड इन टू द मीडिया the topics of my talk today is ever green revolution in food management and health care. Next slide, please. As we all know, food is the basic necessity of all living systems. 
as of now, the world population today is about 7.25 billion, close to about 7.5, which is going to be crossing 8 billion in another two years. And by 2050, it is understood that the population will go beyond 9.7 billion. That's a mammoth figure. As of record in 2021, the entire world produced about 2.2 billion metric tons of grains. But the requirement is about 3 billion tons. So, where will this deficit of 0.8 billion metric tons of grain will come? That is what we are trying to answer in this, in this seminar. India, we all know, was deficient in food grains when we got our freedom in 1947. There used to be a big queue for a couple of kilos of American wheat for the whole day. And that wheat used to come under a scheme called EM 480 from the American government. But in late 1960s, a very crucial event occurred in America with the then Honorable Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who had discussed this story. I, I won't go into details of it. Next slide, please. When she came back from America after not signing that document, under PL 480, she took a vow that she will make the country self reliant in food production. She called an emergency meeting of the scientists, particularly of ICAR. The then director was Dr. Swaminathan, and she said, Dr. Swaminathan, you take whatever you want to. Indian government has open hands for you. But I want to see to it that India becomes self sufficient in food production. Is it possible or not? Dr. Swaminathan said it's a gigantic task, but definitely we can proceed in the right direction and we hope to achieve success. All the angles were energized and India started paddling the pathway of first being revolution. As you all know, Dr. Norman Borrow is supposed to be the father of green revolution in the entire world. He got no right for that also. But Dr. Swaminathan undoubtedly happens to be the father of green revolution in India. He and his colleagues produced a number of varieties of wheat, corn, and several other varieties of important corns. And I feel very glad to tell you that using the principles of green revolution, yes, India became really self-reliant. Next slide, please. What were the objectives of actual objectives of first green revolution? In the one to produce more food grain, pulses vegetables, fruits, etc. And the requirement for this is we need to have improved quality of seeds, 
we need to have new varieties produced by conventional hybridization methods. Production of new new varieties with the help of mutations, either to chemicals or to radiation, whatever it is. The third requirement to achieve the goals of green revolution was chemical fertilizers. Because natural fertilizers which were being used by the farmers were not able to support plant growth well and they used to remain deficient in the elements that are required for wholesome growth of the plant and so the food chain production used to go down. It never reached peak. The third was chemical fertilizers. Fourth important aspect of the revolution was disease control insecticides, fungicides and pesticides were used reasonably to check the diseases that used to engulf a lot of food grain. And the next one, very important, was proper irrigation. After independence, the government had taken some steps to make channels for irrigation, but that was not enough. During the first green revolution, the government became very active and lots of new bore wells were dug up and farmers were provided with sufficient water. And with the help of all these new tenants, what we achieved is shown in the next slide. Next please. Crop disease management is very important because chemical fertilizers, managing water, chemical fertilizers, they used to be either imported or they used to be produced in the country itself and they used to be simply provided to the farmers for uh, reasonable use, discriminated use by the farmers. Very important was how to save the plant from disease, which was nearly about 15 to 20 percent normal loss of food grain, and this loss may go up to about 30 percent, or maybe more loss. As we used to learn from our today, but senior Brahminis used to bring about famine of wheat wherever it used to, you know, spread. So, if disease control was taken as a big challenge by scientists. And what were the six basic principles of disease control? The first one was exclude. Exclude that area which is prone to certain kind of diseases. But that was not always possible, as we know. We cannot leave aside all the plots, so we have to take up other measures also. The second one was eradication. The disease plants used to be uprooted and they used to be burned. That was the solution at the time. So the next cycle of crops will not be invaded by those fungi or bacteria. Next was protection. Protection means make an area which is shielded from all sides, like good boundary walls, and inside we can grow our crops which remains away from those diseases. Another was resistance. How to produce a disease resistant plant, food grain plants? This was supposed to be the best idea, but the problem, the solution was not very easy. 
in order to obtain one disease registered plan, the scientists used to you know spend about 10 to 15 years and then perhaps used to get a good plan for the next generation to, to cultivate. I remember Professor G. M. Reddy used to be a great scholar, a great genesis in Hyderabad. And, yeah, and I had a good opportunity to listen to him in Patna and was still giving a regulation course in Bhakti. He delivered a marvelous, marvelous lecture on how he raised a mutant variety of Cadillus chasm, that is Arthur. He showed excellent, gave excellent pictures. At the end of the lecture, we were asked to ask some, some query or questions. I asked him, Sir, I have a small query. What is the true value of the different variety that you discussed so nicely? He chuckled and said, that is the whole job. The mutant variety that I that I grew has moved to that. I think all our efforts went in vain. To raise a plant, a mutant variety, which is very good to look at, but it has no food value. So disease resistance is very important. Nowadays, raising a disease resistant plant is relatively easy. In those days, it was very, very difficult. The fifth point is treatment. That is, if an area in the field has become diseased, we can remove or try to suppress the disease by using several kinds of fungicides, pesticides, other chemicals, that we used to teach our children during our uh, fungi classes. And next one, very important was the control of vectors which actually spread diseases. They were all taken together in a mission mode by the scientists and the, by, by, by the farmers. And I feel glad to tell you that our country really became self-reliant in food production history. Two, three years ago, food production in India was about maximum through this green revolution was about 235 metric tons, million metric tons, which was uh, self-sufficient to feed the entire population in the Indian subcontinent. Not only that, we were in a position to export much of those things outside. But that was the peak of, of food production. It is stabilized somewhere around 230 million by the first Conventional green revolution methods. But our population, as you know, has been growing tremendously. The scientists were on the run to think about novel measures to boost food production. Then came the era of genetic engineering and biotech. Scientists using the various principles of and tools and techniques of genetic engineering and biotechnology, our country has been able to produce up to 300 million tons of food grain. This is the last year's food. We have gone from 230 to 300. Million. And this is marvelous and this is, I think, more than sufficient for us to feed the entire country. Next slide, please. So we will discuss how 
these objectives were actually obtained. We, as Indians at least, owe a lot of gratitude to this great person, Dr. Ramesh Kantha. He took a vow before the then Prime Minister, Mr. Gandhi, that he and his team will leave no stone unturned to see to it that our country becomes self reliant in food production. Dr. Swaminathan stays in his hometown, Madras, and he has started a Swaminathan Foundation, I think it's pretty long back. From there, he is still working, making plans how to keep this food production intact so that it does not go down, it goes beyond and beyond. He is actually, I like to call him, the father of Indian Green Revolution. But then, this biotechnology has also a limit. We cannot go beyond that. Our land cannot be elastic. We cannot increase our land area. It is limited. So, what do we do? How do we proceed? Not only through grains, but also we have to see to it that the food grain contains sufficient amount of nutrients which supports good health. That is also very important. These plans are still being made by Dr. Kanathan and quite often he comes out in the form of lecture or in the form of some articles. He keeps advising the government and the farmers how to keep their protection system alive and sustainable. You know, every good thing or development or research brings with itself some disadvantages also. We have to live with it. And the disadvantage that green revolution brought in India where these, for example, our soil fertility gradually went, went down due to indiscriminate use of a lot of pesticides, manures, uh, chemical fertilizers, and so on. Because of the use of lot of amount of insecticides and pesticides, Human health was also affected. Cattle health was equally affected. Avian health, birds, that means our poultry forms and several other forms were, were also badly affected. The microbiota, which are good for soil fertility, they were also compromised. Our environment got compromised. And last but not the least, this is the most important, close to my heart and close to my school day also, when we talk about pest. It was very keen that we have lost the taste of basmati, actual basmati. This is true. We have lost and, and found changes in the taste of actual flavor of many things, not only rice. But many vegetables and fruits also. I will discuss with you a couple of examples which is close to my heart. The, the vegetable that I, to, I love most has lost the real taste. Next slide, please. Next one, please. Cauliflower. I remember in my school boyhood days. In one kitchen, if cauliflower flower used to be cooked, the entire halwa used to be, you know, uh, filled with fat, uh, you know, flavor. 
and very good, very good smell, fragrance. We have lost that. When I was a professor and head of biotechnology at MIT as warrior, one of my DTT students asked me to, uh, you know, do some good research so that it is important. I told him that work on cauliflower. Why the modern cauliflower has lost the flavor? Can you do that? Yes, sir. You can try it. And I can do about all this. Uh, in different books and journals and came up with this uh, startling conclusion. He said that cauliflower, which used to be cooked earlier, it used to contain allyl isothiophyllate, dimethyl trisulfide, dimethyl sulfide, DMS, and methyl thio, that is, sulfur is very important in all these compounds. These were the crucial organites which used to come out during cooking of polyflower. But then out of these, only two chemicals were recognized very important for the odor and fragrance of polyflower. They were tenegrin and neo glucoprasicin. These two chemicals are actually the ones which bring actual natural taste to polyflower. We have lost that. Or, either the gene has been silenced, or the gene has been modified in such a way that enough amount of these chemicals are not no more That is the whole job. But then, even today, there are people who keep working how to get the best out of even the modern polyflower groups. Uh, they have come out with some good ideas. They say that if we boil cauliflower, it will lose whatever taste it has. But if we roast it, fry it, microwave it, it will enhance the same fragrance and flavor. Why, what happens with these, I don't have much idea. But this is what the scientists in food and nutrition claim. <coughs> this way we can try to enhance the original odor and fragrance of polyphone. Next slide please. Here comes the intervention of biotechnology in crop management. How do we achieve our food? Why is it essential? It is essential because it can, it can boost production. Number two, it requires reduced amount of chemical fertilizers. Number three, it requires minimal use of insecticides and pesticides. Number four, we can raise climate resilient crop plants also by these methods. Number five, it has reduced threat to human, cattle and avian health also. It causes minimal harm to the ecosystem and try to maintain the ecological balance to a large extent. These are the benefits that biotechnology can give us while boosting food production. Next slide, please. Just now, it's a stick to time. Oh, first. It's a stick to time. There are two minutes. You can finish the time. Okay, okay. So, I'll just give you what kind of tools and techniques the scientists have actually used. One is DT, that is Bacillus Curem James's genes. It's a toxin gene. And this toxin gene, it has been cloned in several of the plants, particularly DT cotton. Now the, the farmers are very rich. 
in cotton production. Bt brinjal. Now the modern brinjal plant that you see it is very good to look at, but taste-wise it is not as good. Another very excellent example is flavor sour tomato. This flavor sour tomato we all use even today in the market. This is not the actual time, original time for, for tomato, but still we get it, that is thanks to flavor sour tomato laid by some certain American scientists. And several cereals, plants, wheat, rice, maize have been cloned with, uh, cloned with using biotechnological spoons and a lot of uh, uh, boost in production has been achieved. Next slide please. Next one please. This is uh, just a glimpse of, on left side you can see how the cotton is growing very well on the right side. This is uh, because of the BG gene that has been grown with. Next slide please. This is uh, brinjal without BG gene. It looks like it, and when we put the BT gene into it, it becomes, next slide please, it becomes like this. But then it has its own uh, detrimental effects. It has only its own threats. Some people are now raising slogans against not using BT ninja because if it can kill ball worms when they, when they digest the, the Brinjal, they die. There is no report so far about the human beings being led to these toxins, but nobody knows. If people do not die, does it mean it doesn't harm the human body? Yes, it must be. So the government as principle has brought introduced a big brinjal in the Indian markets. Next one, please. This is about uh, the tomato, you can see. So very smart technique has been used. There is no BT gene in flavor sema tomato. A gene which produces an enzyme called beta polygalactorunolase. This dissolves pectin which exists on the surface of the tomato. This has been silenced by using antisense techniques. There is no BD gene, there is no, no other addition or change in its genome makeup. Only a gene has been silenced by a smart method. And this is the result. You can see in 10 days, ordinarily, uh, in 20 days, it scribbles by 45 days. It looks almost rotten. On the right panel, you can see with this, uh, with this antisense uh, cloning. The tomatoes are still looking very smart. We are, we are using it in the market today. Next slide, please. Now, I would like to skip many of these because you all must be knowing. I just want to show that how genetic engineering has achieved these targets through genetic engineering, recombinant DNA technology, tissue culture, and transgenics. These three are the principles by which we can raise excellent plants. Uh, following the principles of biology. Next slide, please. <clears throat> About the tools and techniques, this is the natural genetic engineering of plants. Agrobacterium chemophosphines. Next slide, please. Uh, Agrobacterium, this is the history all of you know. In 1907, it was discovered. There are three types of response, uh, uh, Agrobacterium. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a rod set bacteria, it produces generally ground for disease and it has an inherent capability to transfer TDA from its own genome into the plant genome. Very marked. There are other methods also of, of gene transfer, but this is the most reliable method. Next one, please. Uh, in the PI plasmid that is hosted by agrobacterium. Next one, please. Next one. I'll just show you the. This is the plasmid which contains DNA. This plasmid is an extra chromosomal DNA of agrobacterium in the plasmid. And there is a reason here that is called TDA reasons. 
at the proper place we can clone our desired gene into it. And that gene as such will be transferred to the target plants. And that's how we make a genetic modification into our uh, desired uh, plants. This is the molecular aspect of how this uh, DNA goes and gets integrated to the plant genome and brings about changes. Next one, please. These are the alternate methods of, uh, of gene transfer, ballistics, hybridization, chemical method, electroporation, microinjection, and silicon carbide methods. But still, as the bacterium mediated gene transfer, most reliable. Most people do it for this method only. Next one, please. Uh, this is the uh, plants of uh, five plant and three plant, lines of three the borders. Next one, please. Uh, these are the genetic biochemical tools, very important for for these students and maybe for researchers also. And this is RNA. This technology has been used to produce, you know, flavors of a tomato. RNA I is the reference RNA. We do not uh, deal here with the DNA. We only deal with the RNA molecules here. The mRNAs are produced. They are either silenced or degraded, if that is uh, not an important design. And that's how we can we can stop production of proteins using uh, different kinds of RNA I has two types generally small interference RNA and micro RNA. Interference RNA is actually double standard. When it binds the mRNA, it stops its translation. And miRNA binds to the UTI region and disallows the ribosomes to proceed and make the actual thing. This is very important for the young generation people. Uh, this is a very latest discovery of uh, CRISPR-Cas technology. Using this technique, actually, we can introduce, or in another word, we can edit DNA molecules. This is not about bringing about desired modification of genetic makeup of the plant or the animal. This is simply to edit. Say, for example, if a child or a plant is deficient or has some wrong type of uh, nucleotide at a, at a particular place, that particular nucleotide, we can change it very, very precisely. And this is what these two scientists, Jennifer Doudna and Carpentier, have thought about. For this, they have Nobel Prize in 1990. Next slide, please. Uh, they discovered it, I think, in 1912 or 13, and eight years later they got Nobel Prize. This is one. This in nutshell, I would have told you uh, the details about it, but anyway, this is how the Casper Cas9 system works. Next one, please. Next one, please. Uh, this is how we can think about transformation and raise a new plant using these technologies. Next one. This is a big list of edited plants using those techniques. Dozens of plants have been edited. This is not genetic transformation or modification. This is simply editing to suit our own purpose to produce more food grain, more fruits, and more vegetables. Next one, please. Next one. Next one. Next. This is the list. Uh, this is what I wanted to point out. By this genetic editing method, we do not mean we have genetically modified it all. This is simply making smart changes in the genotype or making changes in one nucleotide or one amino acid of a plant. So people now have started calling it, it is not genetic. Next one. Now, uh, adequacy of healthful food production is a necessity of the hour. How do we achieve it? Uh, this is a long one. 
to make things shorter. The government of India has come out with a big plan and this year is being celebrated as the International Year of the Village. Our great sages, ancestors, have identified these plans pretty long back. But today, perhaps we consider that these plans and these brains are no for us. We have almost forgotten it. This is what, as Indians at least, we must realize that these plans were recognized as good food for people, not simply to fill stomach, but to gain or keep our good health going. Next one, please. Next one. This is a small list of what millets actually are. You can see Dwar, Badra, Maize, Finger Millets, Small Millets, Barnyard Millet, Bosco Millet, uh, Little Millet, Kodo, Fox, Tell Millet, Badi, Kobi, as our friend, Professor Vijayan Mathai, working on Kobi also a lot these days. Next slide will show you some of these 3M. This is also called 3M by the government of India. This is Badra, Swar, Raki, Sama, Tangali, Kodo, Kutki, and China. Fortunately, last night I had the good fortune of eating the pudding of Sama, which was marvelous. I asked him, is it made up of Matana? He said, no. He said, no, it is made up of Sama. It was wonderful, really. It's like this. We have also in our bags, our ancestors and disease have given us several kinds of wild fruits that as child we have been using, we have forgotten them. Umpty number of these wild fruits we have been using. Say for example, these small, small black nuts, this is the molly fruit, and on the right side is uh, is kamada. this is palm tree. They are all laden with good nutrients. This is just a small glimpse of what wild fruits in our country look like. They are all very useful. We, know, we need to harness all those nutrients as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Next one, I think we are going to end. Healthcare. About 40% prescription medicines today come from plants. And if we merge with it, Many healthcare needs, it comes to be about 60%. And if we add up all the natural resources in, as medicine, it goes to about 80%. Only 20% are perhaps synthetic or genetic or so on. So, so we have to work on this. Uh, next one, please. Uh, just give you. I'll just give you a very small visual of Vithanya Sumitra. I didn't know much about it. When I heard about its medicinal efficacy, this is uh, the different types of glimpses of Vithanya Sumitra. This belongs to Solan Sitanya. And next one, please. What all it can do for us, uh, this Vithanya has a tremendous medicinal value. Uh, a couple of days I was going through some literature. It has lecithin content which can make useful, efficacious transformation in our in our uh, uh, mind controls, nervous system also. Apart from using it as an energy material, energy drink. We can use it for, for nervous system source. With this glimpses, I'd like to put an end to the talk. And I thank you all for patient listening to my good day, who tolerated me for so long. Thank you very much, Mr. Ask the audience to ask any question if you do have.
I know, I know. I know, I know. But when we talk about Sri uh, which is useful for us health wise. It should come. It should come under the ring of people. Yes, yes. But it will be the ring is three and no doubt. Sri One clarification I have. And uh, it's the most moving, uh, second leading cause of death globally after accidents. 
So cancer uh, belongs to large group of diseases belonging to uh, uh, the cancers of any part of the body, human body, or the tissue, which uh, is uh, actually the uncontrollable growth of cells that can spread to other parts of the body. The process is called metastasis. Recently, in 2020, WHO reported uh, over uh, 19 million new cases of cancer and uh, about 10 million deaths annually due to cancer, which include the both population, I mean the male and female. The other uh, uh, name for cancer are neoplasm or malignant tumor, and uh, when it spreads to other part of the body, it's called metastasis. So, what are the risk factors for the development of the cancer? So, certain risk factors include the use of uh, uh, carcinogens, carcinogens, as well as uh, alcohol and tobacco. Uh, so, the carcinogens are responsible for some of the changes in the body, which can include both genetic and epigenetic changes. That means it can cause a mutation to, uh, within the DNA of the cells or the factors which can, uh, the, which can be changed due to cancer are some of the epigenetic factors which can regulate the genetic material. Also, uh, there are some inborn error of metabolism due to cell division and which can also give rise to DNA damage and eventually cancer. Other uh, causes of cancer can be the inherited uh, mutations uh, coming from the parental, uh, either the father or the mother. And some of the cancer uh, that includes the inherited mutation are uh, uh, FAP and Gardner syndrome. And they can change, uh, they can be responsible due to the inherited change in the APC genes. So, uh, if you want to differentiate between the normal and the cancer cells, the normal cells under the microscope can be uh, seen as a uniform in size and shape and also the spheroid, normally the uh, spheroid shape and uh, having the single nucleus and uh, it has a most uh, larger cytoplasmic volume which is controls, which has a control growth and they normally remain in the integral location, I mean they don't spread to other parts of the body. In case of cancer, they can have the irregular uh, shell shape and size, they can have the darker nucleus, they can have the small cytoplasmic volume and they can have the uncontrolled growth to a certain part of the body and they can also uh, uh, extend to other uh, part of the body, uh, I mean to speak to the different part of the body. <clears throat> so uh, there are some changes in the gene which can cause cancer. So, uh, the genes which are mostly changed in cancer are the proto oncogenes. I mean, the genes which can cause the cancer, which are they're called proto oncogenes. Then there are some genes which normally suppress the uh, tumor in the cells. There are some mutation in those genes and which can cause the cancer. So they are called tumor suppression genes. And the third part of the genes are DNA repair genes, which are uh, mutating or uh, this enzymes. They are called the driver of cancer. Multiply, there are hundreds of cancers now, and they are not usually named uh, the organs from which or tissue that which uh, the cancer originate. For example, in the case of lung cancer, uh, it starts in the lung, similar to the brain cancer, they can start in the brain, etc. And uh, the current modality of treatment of cancer included a surgical method, you can remove the part of the tumor that has, has the uncontrollable growth. Or uh, the treatment can also include, uh, along with the surgical method, the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and currently uh, uh, the most uh, advanced method for uh, treatment of cancer, which is uh, still in experimental clinical trials, is the immunotherapy. So the, uh, the select lack of selectivity of uh, anti-cancer drugs. The lack of selectivity of anti-cancer drugs. Uh, and it can produce the off-target activity also, such as hair loss, the suppression of the immune system, and anemia, bleeding, and loss of appetite. So, uh, originally, uh, uh, the direct treatment of cancer is for chemotherapy, surgery, and radiotherapy. But sometimes, uh, uh, certain cancer cells they become resistant toward the chemotherapeutic drugs, which can lead to the treatment failure. So. Those ability of the cancer cells, which can uh, uh, give them the power to uh, resist to the treatment profile of the unrelated drugs, and they, they do not share a common mechanism of action, it is known as the multi drug resistance. So uh, nowadays, the treatment the challenge is to uh, is to target those cells which have the multi drug resistance. So uh, the drug resistance can be divided into two categories: it's intrinsic or acquired resistance. The intrinsic means uh, uh, 
uh, it is described the treatment of the chemotherapy drugs. So that's an innate mechanism of action of those cells, and the interesting is this can be generated by uh, by the mutation of the tumor cells or by the development of resistant populations such as cancer stem cells, which I'll be discussing furthermore also in my presentation in the heterogeneous tumor. For example, the tumor cell population does not consist of a single type of cell; it consists of multiple types of cells which have the different uh, roles to play. And some of the cells inside those multiple types are called cancer stem cells. That means, as we, as we all know, the stem cells they are originate to, uh, originating population of those uh, kind of cells. So the cancer stem cell here has the same meaning, but uh, those stem cells retain the property to uh, uncontrollably divide, and that can lead to cancer. Part of the system can also be respons uh, uh, responsible because of the calcification mechanisms under the normal physiological conditions. But also the cells over the time develop resistance after receiving anti-cancer therapy. For example, uh, uh, you might have seen some of the patients coming into a clinic and uh, they have already received uh, one kind of anti-cancer therapy, but the tumor has mutated so much that those uh, uh, anti-cancer therapy may not be effective anymore on those kind of patients. So it is called acquired resistance. The acquired resistance can be linked to various cellular and molecular responses. First is activation of the skin proto-oncogene, after the treatment of cancer cells. The second is the alteration in drug targets. The third is the drug metabolism of tumor. The fourth is the influx of drugs, that means to, uh, uh, the cells can uh, uh, influx the drugs which are uh, uh, given to those cells, and uh, this is the presence of some of the transporters on the membrane. Most of those transporters come in the category of ABC transporters or ATP binding cassettes. The, four, the fifth is the epigenome alteration due to uh, some of the uh, mechanisms like acetylation, methylation of the cells. And uh, here also some of the uh, encoding RNAs, these are called microRNAs, they can play a certain role uh, which create the uh, changes in the uptake of the downstream structure. The last one is the change in the tumor microenvironment, uh, which can be uh, caused due to uh, uh, the treatment profile. So, so after doing a certain kind of therapy, uh, the tumor microenvironment can change and those cells become more resistant toward the therapy. So all these mechanisms, either draw, uh, acquired or the intrinsic, uh, they can act independently or combination and they can favor the multi-reader resistance in kind of cancer. So overall, if I can summarize uh, uh, my presentation here, Elliot. So the resistance can be due to the epithelial to mesothelial transition. That means when the cell metastasizes to different part of the body, it can be due to the cancer metabolism, the byproduct of uh, cancer, uh, due to the oxidative stress to the cells, due to the drug inactivation, due to the of program cell death, due to the drug reflex by the ADP transporter family, due to the DNA, uh, uh, DNA damage repair mechanism, inflammation, brain drug toxification, drug toxins, tumor microenvironment, genetic changes, and immune therapy and immune response. So now, uh, the various approaches to target MDR in cancer uh, includes the development of certain drugs which can uh, evade the ABC transporters. For most of the transporters are present on the cells which has the ability to, uh, to efflux uh, certain type of drugs which are given in cancer. So, uh, so the primary method for identifying the MDR was to select the surviving cancer cells in the presence of fat toxic drug. For example, if you give toxic drugs to cells, some of the cells actually remain uh, viable in the population, and those cells have the uh, mechanism. So, only you isolate those cells and then you characterize those cells based on certain markers like the ABC transporters. So those transporters can also be responsible for the decrease of the water-soluble drugs such as folate antagonists, which are already given in kind of anti-cancer therapy, nucleoside analogs and cisplatin. And uh, these are normally drugs required to enter the cells for their uh, cancer potential. But those transporters, when they are present and when they are uh, upregulated on the surface of the cancer cells, they can uh, do a decrease of the of uh, these all drugs. And uh, uh, there are certain changes in the cells also, 
and uh, which affect the capability of the toxic drugs to kill the cells, which include the alteration in the DNA cycle, increase in the DNA of, uh, repair mechanism, and reduce apoptosis in altered metabolism of drugs. And also, uh, there is a possibility of uh, um, an energy dependent influx of hydrophobic drugs, uh, which are given as anti cancer treatment. And uh, uh, all these possibilities lead to the, uh, uh, the formation of multiple resistance in cancer. So this I already told you, I'm skipping this because of the uh, short amount of time. So uh, now summarizing what is MDR and why it's so important. So MDR, multiple resistance, can be defined as a property when the cancer cell become resistant to drugs that carry more structural and functional resemblance with each other. So it's a uh, challenge against the current chemotherapeutic drug regime. And uh, uh, I'm going to discuss one of the for MDR that we are studying in our laboratory, that is an ATP binding test of the Cascoco family. So, briefly describing what is the uh, ABC transporter family. Um, so the ATP binding test the transporter family uh, uh, include uh, uh, some of the uh, transporters. One is uh, ABCB1, it's also a pleak like a protein, hydrophobic for the surface of the cells, and it's one of the most widely studied transporters, uh, which is responsible for uh, uh, MDR in cancer cells, and it is responsible for the influx of the chemotherapeutic drugs out of the cells. The other transporters, which are present in different kinds of cancer, uh, along with PGP, pleak like protein, are the uh, ABCD2 or CC1. So it is depending on the kind of cancer they are present on. All those come under the cancer category of ABC transporter family. So if you see the ABC transporter uh, in the in the picture, it is showing two kind of information. One is output confirmation and one is input information. So there is a change in the confirmation when the drugs find the way to the phase. Okay, and uh, I already told you, I am skipping this. This is some of the uh, basic study that has been done in case of multiple resistance in cancer. So, um, this is a case study which was done in 1973 when, uh, when the PGP-3 uh, glycoprotein was uh, um, uh, shown to be a surface glycoprotein. And, uh, and further studies in uh, subsequent years show that uh, it is responsible for multiple resistance in cancer cells. Okay. And uh, in the market, currently there are several inhibitors which has been uh, studied for the uh, reversal of the PGP to the protein. So that means the reversal of the MDR. And uh, this means the second generation, generation, second generation and third generation inhibitors. And uh, examples are, uh, different examples are given here. The first generation include uh, Rampil as like a story A. Second generation are the a better version of the first generation and as subsequent the third generation. But all these still are not sufficient because uh, even the third generation one, it does not overall uh, protect the cells from the MDR. So there is a need actually to discover more uh, MDR inhibitors so that uh, the cancer cells can be effectively killed. So I already told you. I also want to show, uh, tell you about one thing which is also one of the core area of research that is cancer stem cells. Uh, so uh, the cancer stem cells are these, they are a population of cancer cells. They have a unique ability to use it in different way. So uh, uh, the mechanism of cancer is like this. Uh, you can take out the tumor or you can give it a radiotherapy and chemotherapy, which can completely raise the tumor. But sometimes uh, the patient comes again after a few years in the clinic, and uh, those patients have the uh, revival of the cancer, either in the same place or at a different place. And uh, you know, because all this treatment of uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, radiotherapy can kill most still certain population remains in the cancer cells, which are called cancer stem cells. So they are actually uh, kind of uh, uh, immune towards the treatment profile that we are currently giving. And more studies have been done in recent 10 years about the cancer stem cells. And uh, now we know some of the mechanism that can be able to in cancer stem cells. And uh, uh, scientists all over the world are trying to discover the new therapeutic program to kill those origin of cancer, that is cancer stem cells. So uh, one of the properties of cancer stem cells is also uh, display the embryo characteristics. And this has been already shown by both individual as well as in vivo mechanisms uh, by uh, doing the cancer zero study in uh, in uh, new mice. 
And uh, now there are several existing evidences to suggest that ancestors themselves they are involved in the mechanism leading to MGR. And therefore, uh, if we totally want to uh, uh, get rid of the cancer or the cancers themselves, so we have to first of all uh, target the whole tumor and then also the cancer themselves. And the third is we have to target the, I mean, we have to overcome the multiple resistance which can uh, give the appreciable uh, prognostics in cancer patients. Lastly, uh, I told you in my previous slides also, uh, the small uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, uh, which has been studied in the past 20 years, they have been shown also uh, to be uh, giving rise to MDR in cancer. So, uh, uh, some of the micro-RNAs, they have been shown negative like a PGK protein, for example, micro rna 451 uh, has been shown in the of MCM11, cell line and breast cancer cells. And similar uh, phenomena was also observed in the case of blood cancers like leukemia and hepatocellular carcinoma. So I'm skipping this slide. Um, so uh, coming back to uh, the approaches that we have done in my laboratory. So uh, to target MDR in cancer, first of all, we have uh, been applying uh, computational approaches. Uh, so uh, we have been studying the uh, plethora of uh, drugs computationally and uh, using several libraries uh, in silico libraries and uh, we have been doing the docking and simulation studies to target those drugs over the PGP protein and to find out the novel drug who can have the ability to bind to the PGP and uh, after simulation that is uh, over the time uh, which can be stable in binding between the drug and the PGP protein. So uh, there are several which are involved to target MDR and cancer. So the first is identification of potential biomarker using expression data which is already present uh, uh, with a lot of literature in uh, some of our uh, databases. And uh, then the prediction of treatment response by machine learning method. Then uh, to identify the drug target interaction. Then to uh, look for the subcellular population within the MDR phenotype and use the molecular modeling method to guide and enhance the drug discovery. Right, so uh, this is one of the papers that we have published in 2018 in my laboratory. And uh, it says the targeting of um, the multiple resistance protein is called MRP1 for the reversal of MDR in cancer. So here we have employed, uh, employed a computation approach. Uh, and we have seen uh, there are several sites for the uh, ABC transporter. We had, and we have targeted MRP, the nuclear in the way of ABC transporter, which are the actual small protein. And we have uh, uh, studied a lot of libraries and we have come out with certain molecules using molecular protein and molecular dynamic simulation approach, which can target the MRP1 of uh, in case of the uh, cancer. So this is the overall summary that we have done. So uh, on the left side, we have taken the MDR protein domain and then we have prepared the protein and receptor regeneration. On the right side, you can see we have used the FDA library accounts. And then we have done the dropping, uh, uh, the third, I mean, combining both the steps and ligand, we have done the dropping, and we have a certain compound, we have a score, we have, we have a particular score, and then we have done the simulation, and we have found that two uh, compounds that are efficient to trade, and the premium uh, uh, metronate, they have been chosen after the simulation studies, and this compound has a uh, better prediction in targeting, uh, and we are looking, that is MRP1. Second uh, publication that we have done from my laboratory uh, is, uh, is about natural flavonoid per se. And we have shown that the per uh, acts as a PGP modulator uh, uh, by binding the, uh, I mean, by looking, by blocking the signal from nucleotide binding domain to trans membrane domain of uh, ATP binding ethics. And uh, here, if, have, uh, if you can see, we have uh, first of all modeled human PGP because uh, the structure was present in mouse. So we have done the modeling uh, from the right, from the mouse to the human PGP. And in the human PGP, you can see the multiple sites present, the ATP binding site, where the actual ATP hydrolysis takes place. So we have uh, uh, shown some of the compound that can bind to the ATP binding site and uh, which can block the confirmation changes. And uh, 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 this is showing that uh, 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 the molecule of interest that is quercetin that you can bind to the three principal site, that is ATP binding site, and also the uh, intercellular helical and ATP binding interface of the PGP. So uh, now in, in my laboratory, we are trying to, because this is all computational data, and uh, we are trying to look forward towards in vitro in vivo experiments, so whether this that we have already discovered, they can be more, uh, uh, more uh, 
possible at the more possible mechanism of uh, binding the uh, binding to ADP binding protein of big uh, uh, protein and uh, uh, their higher inhibiting inhibition, which is actually required for MDR. So thereafter, we can uh, I mean, we can think of blocking the MDR mechanism by using those compounds. Uh, before ending my talk, uh, I would like to tell you uh, uh, one of the mechanisms that we have uh, discovered in my laboratory, and it is about stimic. So, stimic uh, uh, is one of the proteins which is present in almost 70 percent of the cancer, and currently uh, there is no uh, drug available which can uh, target the stimic protein. Uh, so, uh, in my laboratory in 2016 uh, 17, we have started. Uh, uh, the molecules we have we are trying to find the molecules that can inhibit the CMIC. But the problem with CMIC is CMIC is not alone, it can bind to a certain factor called MAX, which I can show you later on the presentation. And uh, uh, it is itself an intrinsically disordered protein, that means it does not have its shape on its own. After binding to CMIC and MAX, they can have a certain shape. So that's why it's so difficult to target CMIC uh, over the time. And uh, now uh, people are doing different strategies. And, uh, they so I will be talking about cancer stem cells and uh, okay and one more thing CMIC is also much higher ability in cancer stem cells. So if we are able to target the CMIC then we can be able to target uh, cancer stem cells without the origin of the cancer. So I am skipping this what is CMIC. So we have uh, included two, uh, two approaches to target CMIC cancer. First is uh, indirect targeting, and then is direct the targeting. Indirect means we are targeting upstream pathway of CMIC signaling cancer, and direct means we directly target the CMIC or CMIC and X binding drug. So in the first pathway, uh, indirect targeting, we have developed like, a collaboration with the uh, one of the professor of IIT, Dr. Venkatrishnan, and here we have synthesized a whole activity of compounds. And uh, after this is showing the uh, cell variability data of, of the, these compounds, and we have selected one or two compounds which is having the highest toxicity value. That is the, uh, if you can see, the uh, lowest cell variability in the cell. So we have selected only two compounds for our further study. It's called CMPBM. And here on the right side, you can see the quantum images that shows the apoptosis um, uh, 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 of the cells after treatment with the CMPBM. Then we were thinking about the what are the targets that can be uh, you know targeted. What are the other uh, which can be targeted by CMPBM? And one of the targets that we have found using computational approach is serine protein protein kinase called PIN1. And uh, the talking uh, uh, study shows that indeed uh, uh, CNPBM binds to the and uh, it can also produce many more. So uh, this is showing that PIM1 and PIM2 separate PIM1. Finally, PIM1 is an upstream molecule of MIC, which can cause a phosphorylation of MIC, which increases its stability. Thereafter, we are targeting PIM1 and we are targeting MIC indirectly. So this is the first study that we have shown indirectly targeted. So next study is going to show the direct targeting of MIC. So uh, recently in 2021, we have published a GBC paper on, uh, on uh, uh, direct targeting of MIC. It's called uh, one of the inhibitors that we have discovered in our laboratory. It's called uh, L755, uh, It inhibits the, uh, the diamondization of semic and X, and it can induce a process in cancer cells. So I'm skipping this. So, uh, so the main idea of this is uh, normally for the oncogenic phenotype, we require a of MIC and MAX, and uh, this can lead to further signaling. But if we are able to do the interaction of MIC and MAX using certain inhibitors, the oncogenic phenotype can be inhibited. The main problem uh, for this study was, uh, because I already told you, CMIC is an intrinsically disordered protein, so it does not have its own shape, but when it's going to max, it can cause some changes in the confirmation. But the area of the, uh, uh, even the binding of CMIC and max, there is a very large flat surface, and in the flat surface, it can
get it. So one of the molecules that were identified was uh, was a molecule called L seven triple five zero seven, and then we have done the in vitro data to prove that your uh, To prove that in these three, three cell lines, uh, there is a in of the mix and uh, uh, by uh, at, I mean, I mean at the protein level also, the inhibition of the mix takes place. Then these inhibitors uh, also inhibit the mutant colony forming assay. So this means uh, the cell lines can be, uh, uh, these inhibitors can restrict the movement of the uh, cells and also they can decrease the cloning population of the cells. Hello? Okay, all right, sir. So, uh, this inhibitor can also induce the apoptosis of the cancer cells. Uh, this is the uh, flow cytometry data, which shows um, uh, which shows a decrease in uh, uh, the viable cell after treatment with uh, this inhibitor. And finally, it, uh, uh, it was shown that this uh, treatment uh, with this inhibitor can decrease the expression of the milk target genes. So here we conclude that it's actually targeting milk, and that's why the, uh, there's a decrease in the expression of the further downstream genes of the milk, like CAD, MLP, ODCN, etc. Finally, uh, by using the uh, uh, amino precipitation, we have proved that uh, indeed it can block the, this inhibitor can block the binding of the silicon max heterodimination. So finally, all, all this data stated that uh, the semic and max interaction can be inhibited by uh, using this inhibitor, and thereby the oncogenic phenotype can also be inhibited. Um, so I would like to stop my presentation here by giving uh, thanks to all my current lab members. And some of the lab members at IIT Mandi, uh, Dr. Rajneesh Kiri, Dr. Vankar Krishnan, Dr. Narendra Singh at IIT Roper, and uh, uh, Dr. Mohanek Kumar Group at Pondicherry University, Dr. Timish Tripathi at Long. Most of the facilities, IIT facility, because I was an earlier uh, Ramachan Fellow at IIT Mandi, and the funding agency uh, for SERP uh, and internal funding agency of IIT Mandi and BHU. Thank you very much. I am ready for the questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Sir, actually, I'm not able to clearly hear uh, the voice. Sorry, sir. Uh, could you please? Uh, research therapy is said to be very useful in cancer treatment. Is it cost effective? Sir, if I understood the question correctly, you said in cancer therapy, is it possible to? Stem cell therapy is said to be very effective in cancer treatment. Is it so? Stem cell. Okay, treating stem cell, you said it's very effective yeah. for treating yeah. therapy or not. Okay. Well, I understood the question now. So, uh, sir, uh, the cancer stem cell concept has recently been originated in the past 10 years. Before, uh, you know, it was not uh, in picture. And yes, it will be effective along with the current therapy mechanism also because you want to treat not only cancer stem cells uh, but also the whole tumor. And the tumor is a heterogeneous population. It's not comprised of only one cell. It comprises of multiple kinds of cells. So now the approach is to uh, isolate the single cells from the tumor to characterize it and to uh, advance the therapy against it. So if you want to target actually the whole tumor, you have to target the surrounding cells, the cancer stem cells, and the other cells which are together with it. So a combinatorial therapy will be definitely essential in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you
हेलो वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू ऑल आई कैन हियर यू वेलकम Please proceed. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, introducing me, and uh, thank you so much for giving me opportunity to uh, share my work uh, with the uh, distinguished scientists and uh, the scholars. Uh, I'm going to take all of you to a beautiful world of orchids. Can you hear? Am I audible? You have to finish your talk within fifteen minutes. Uh, how much time, Raksha? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> I will just try. I'll try in fifteen minutes. Okay. So I'm going to take you to beautiful world of orchids, and I'm going to speak on orchid diversity in India, threats and conservation strategies. I always uh, start this. These are the most beautiful flowers uh, on this earth, and I always start the poem. with the poem that in six days god did with man to rule it all he made the mountains and lakes as well as forests tall and he bedecked the land with flowers and with odors fresh and sweet and the evening of the sixth day found the earth now all complete and when he viewed his handiwork upon the seventh day one flower family caught his eye and caused the lord to say their blooms are surely regal and their beauty is free for the beautiful forms and colors constitute a poet's dream then god knelt down and blessed this plants and tenderly he said very beautifully that i call this family orchid its number shall spread to all the regions of this earth and its bloom shall be the queen of all the flowers i have ever seen now as far as orchids are concerned in the world there are 600 genera and 30000 species and in india we have a Uh, orchid genetic diversity of about constituting about 155 genera and 1,256 species, and they are highly cosmopolitan and they are present all over the world except the Antarctic regions. Uh, they are highly diverse, evolved and directed appreciation. Uh, they are inherently slow growers. In fact, their seeds are non-endospermic and very small. They cannot germinate on land like other plants. so that is the reason you know they are highly endangered threatened rare extinct plants and all of these plants come under the category of endangered plants now the seeds you know uh, though they are very small and non endospermic they require a suitable mycorrhizal association for the germination in nature and those even lucky seeds who get this mycorrhizal association for the germination in nature even uh, less than 1% seeds uh, you know uh, germinate in nature and those seeds which germinate in nature it takes 6 to 12 years for the seeds uh, like uh, from the germination to the flowering stage this is irony of these plants and vegetative growth is very slow and uh, post pollination development of use they have a long shelf life now there are multi million dollar cut flower industries through in many countries of world like you can think of usa japan thailand netherlands and all that and they not only they are not, not only for the beauty of the flowers they have the long shelf life flowers have long shelf life they can be you know uh, they they fresh you know uh, starting from uh, one week to even three months time so they have pollination related floral complexity so and uh, they like to get them pollinated and uh, reproduce further but then they would like to assume various shapes like for example even bee orchid grass orchid scorpion orchid and so on i'm going to show you all the diversity of these orchids in the coming slides and there are really defined barriers of reproductive isolation which is a very very important point because for any species to occur we know that there has to be morphological Uh, isolation barriers and the reproductive isolation barriers they have to coevolve right but here the morphological barriers evolve but reproductive barriers don't don't coevolve with the result that there is a free gene flow across 
and uh, more than you know one lakh hybrids you know are available in nature and up to even hexagenic hybrids have also been produced now they are epiphytic as you can see in the first picture and they are they grow on the tree you can see their roots you know and these roots are covered with the velamen which is like cork like substance for absorbing moisture atmosphere and these are the and uh, these pictures uh, you know these are the terrestrial plants which have tubers on the underground and these tubers are uh, from, from these for these tubers you know these plants are very very medicinally important highly medicinally important and these you know uh, tubers uh, they are dried and the powder is formed and this powder is known as salep now this salep is uh, I mean, used for uh, preparing a large number of uh, medical formulations for curing large number of ailments so as i told they may be terrestrial they may be epiphytic they may be epiphytic they may be subterranean subterranean means they they live in the underground you know below the ground throughout their life in the farming time they will try to come out so here uh, these are the best plants which are like fungi we don't know what kind of association do they have till now but they have definitely a very good kind of a uh, relationship with these plants and here is a this is a, again a very very rare plant which is called salem panja its uh, botanical name is dactyla rhizohetera which is uh, i think we uh, found this plant in 1986 after that you know uh, this plant has become very rare and uh, it is uh, we found it uh, from manali you know down the hill up to about 10 kilometers from the you know valley and uh, this plants of the tubers of these plants are called uh, uh, because of the tubers of this plant this plant is known as salem panja they're panja like and these tubers are sold at the rate of 20000 kp many folks come and lure the local people take this uh, you know tubers away to the different countries so there are these tubers are produced here chronic and used for many curing for many pets uh, or ailments so this is a plant i was telling about they remain throughout the under the ground and only during the flowering it is coming out so this is one of the epiphytic plant i wanted to show how beautiful the flowers are they are growing on the tree this is the trobium tree and this is again one of the epiphytic tree with the long can stems with nodes and it's a not good color and this is again one of the epiphytic tree which is uh, which is growing on the tree in association with some ferns now as i wanted to do they are the most which is called on earth so there are different sizes shapes and colors and you know correct uh, picture of this uh, is one of the you know uh, petal is modified into a, a lip like shape which is also called lip or labellum and then the pollens are uh, other the the the, 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 the sex organs are you know male there are active organ filaments and all that they are fused and to form a pigium uh, and then pollen pollen are there and then this of resupination is again a characteristic feature that the ovary get rotated at an angle angle of 180 degree so that the uh, the the attractive part uh, you know are uh, in the middle to make it more attractive to attract the insects the plants are mostly bisexual but there are a few examples of bisexual as well no i brought this slide uh, so students can distinguish between normal lilies and flower and the opidaceous here all the petals are of the same kind colored highly colored but here one of the petal is modified you know so as the character is this uh, floral <coughs> diagram is concerned it's a trimeres you know and right at the end and collinear so here the resupination example where the stalk gets uh, repeated at an angle of degree so here the cap the fruit where when it's busted the seeds are uh, you know released and all the views are in uh, are dichotomously arranged branches so here is the gynostigium and one for tiles it means there is the pollinia so here you know uh, as it is pollination concerned this plant is cleistogaming many of the uh, your flowers don't open and then it can be and then it can be and then it can be cross pollination at this plant you can see in this picture and this is the pollination 
is there, which is very interesting feature in this plant, in pseudo, you know, sets, you know. And the flower would like to uh, the insect, you know, so the flowers would uh, like to pick the female partners of the male insects. So male insects would come, sit on the flower, just taking it as a, it as a female partner, and this in the return would like to take back the pollinia so that they may be uh, the cross pollinia, the pollinia may be taking the flower. So they they mimic this, they mimic this uh, insect. Then they, what kind of attraction should we take in the flower, the flower nectar, which is present from a glucose, fructose, sucrose, callus muscles are there, beautiful colored uh, uh, flowers are there, beautiful colored lip is there. So here this is uh, uh, one of the orchids, you know, in the, during the David time, uh, it had a, you know, this uh, flower, you know, had a long uh, uh, spur. So it was thought at that time the spur was about flower spur was about seven to forty-three centimeter long. At that time, Darwin thought that it must have a pollinator with the long proboscis. And later on, you know, this pollinator, Xanthoman morgani, was discovered in 1907 with a really long spur. So there are various you know, and accordingly they are pollinated by bees, butterflies, moths, birds, and flies. They are highly fragrant also. No, this is orchid where it looks like a what this uh, petal telling about the lipper labellum. It has taken the shape of a female uh, uh, lady slipper, I would say, and this is also called lady slipper orchid. So here again, you can see the pattern, you know, on the lip, so that it can attract various insects. You can see this is red vanda and highly beautiful. This is one of the rare uh, species in India, which is also mentioned in the appendix one. So here you can see the mimicry, how do these uh, flowers are mimicking the uh, I mean, female partners of the male insect. You can see the color patterns, everything, it looks like the same. <clears throat> Again, I wanted to show you some pictures where you can see and admire the way the insects and then the color of the flower. So this is uh, uh, one of the uh, flying bird orchid. It doesn't, doesn't it look like the flying bird? You know, where uh, whenever any insect comes, it has a mechanism to try to like to trap it inside, and then when it has to come out, it has to come out touching the pollinia. So it has to bring the pollinia along. So very smart plant. Now this is one of the bucket orchid, you know. Here one third, three fourth uh, of the bucket is always filled with some kind of fluid. When any insect comes, it's on the rim of this uh, bucket. It would like to smear its legs in the fluid. And uh, you know, uh, during this process, while he's enjoying, he, uh, fell, he like he falls down the in the bucket. And when it has to come, it struggles to come out, you know, of the flower. When it when it has to come out. It has to come uh, touching the pollinia. Uh, so now whenever it comes out, it has to take the pollinia along. You can see the insect pollinia along. It is trying to come in out. So doesn't it like dancing lady orchid with the frog, with the arms and all that? So how they are mimicking the various objects, their insects and all that? Uh, very interesting. So doesn't it like a cocoon orchid, uh, the hair, the labellum is looking like a cocoon. This is called a cocoon orchid. This is one of the preferred the lady slipper orchid. Now here I was in Miami, you know, uh, South America, we have one of the breeder has produced this hybrid. Normally there is a one lady slipper, you know, uh, which is formed of the labellum. But here there were no two lady slippers. I just wanted to show it to the students so they can, just, they can just admire the beauty of these flowers. Now here the pseudo cognition process. You can can you distinguish between the I mean the flower and the uh, insect? No, the male insect is sitting on the flower uh, of the orchid, which is making the female partner of uh, this male insect. You can see the shape, color, everything on their name. So here again, uh, pseudo copulation mimicking. You can see the beautifully colored flower and mimicking the female insect of this flower. So this is process is called through the population. So there are uh, some associations with ants, uh, these plants also, and uh, there is also one uh, carnivorous orchid which is observed that through the 
carbon, you know, when carbon was factory sorted, you know, it was uh, discovered that this ants, uh, they would like to stay, you know, in the old uh, uh, so the bulbs of this plant and it was assumed that they are eating those ants but later on it was discovered uh, through one of the paper that uh, when the carbon label the glucose was given in the honey they were killed and then it was uh, the carbon level you know ants they were coming in the uh, in the biochemical analysis the, uh, whatever it was that you know these are the roots uh, uh, seeds things are very structure with a small homogeneous mass of cells, which is every round shaped embryo. And uh, <coughs> so these uh, seeds, when they germinate uh, in nature, they have to come in association with a suitable mycorrhizal fungus for association and germination in nature. So, fungal that defines the rise of cloning forms fungal hyphae are efficiently growing inside. And mycorrhizal plants are because it is higher net, with higher net rate and with nitrogen and other mineral uh, contents. Now, whenever the orchids were first discovered, they were discovered for their properties. So they were used for curing the ripe of these plants, and they, are, they were used for as a tonic and to cure nervous disorders, to cure digestive problems, to cure cardiac problems as an expectorant, as an anti cancerous Also, they have been discovered. Whatever is written in the bracket to the uh, the plant parts which have been used. So there is one plant which is also used to enhance the longevity. Now there is one American scientist, Professor Raditi. He just surveyed, you know, um, with the survey of all the international scientists who are working on the orchid. Uh, so it was uh, found out that those people who are working, or those are those people who are working in association with orchids, one or the other way, they have the rapid life 12 years more than the other. So this is a just allurement or this is just encouragement to the young students to take orchids to cultivation. So this is just a welcoming step to them. Now, in the, even uh, I was telling the Ayurvedic system of medicine, a group of eight drugs, which is known as Ashtab, is also used in the preparation of various rejuvenating formulations and tonics, such as Chavan. In Chavan Prash, if there are you know, eight species are used, out of these eight species, the four are uh, of it. So, like Rishpa, Kiva, Vritti, Vridhi. So, these are from belonging family or crazy. And uh, my three, well, students are working on all these medicine plants. So, Salam, I want to tell about its uh, tubers. You know, can see it is the like So, floral is important. I'm just coming to how the long lasting flowers are intricately fabricated. They're beautifully they're frag fragrant. Now here I wanted to show you this picture. I took this uh, picture of hybrid in China, you know, during the international conference where this hybrid was displayed, and it was a beautiful texture, like a chenille kind of texture. It was displayed. Now, okay, a beautiful orchid, uh, the hybrid with uh, beautiful lip, beautifully orange-colored orchid and with a yellow petal, epidendrum radicans. Now, this is also called smiling orchid or brush orchid. This is Dendrobium smiling. See the, how they are sampling various objects. This is a white orchid, the uh, moth orchid. Now, doesn't it look like a pineapple orchid, you know? So, it's a Dendrobium densiflora. Now, I was in Nage, Miami, on the farm. Here, I just took uh, the brush orchid. You can see. And the uh, the base and then the bristles of the toothbrush you can see you can see even this species growing in the orchid farm so again the beautiful beautiful orchid with beautiful color patterns and the color and in the floral mimicry i'm coming uh, so doesn't it look like a vast orchid see the moth orchid where it is resembling the insect of a male insect. How beautifully uh, it has colored itself. Again, a bird orchid, which you have seen. Uh, moth orchid. It has not left in the shape of a helmet, so it is called a helmet orchid. Flying duck orchid. Naked man orchid. Dracula, monkey orchid. You can see its nose, eyes. Even it has not left Punjabi Jutti to resemble, you can see. Even the ghost orchid with the stick in its hand. No, 
no value addition. So you can see that you've already seen the beauty and utility of these orchids in many aspects. So there is a need for value addition in the orchids. There are large orchids to be used, you know, for the value addition. And there is a, uh, there is a folk medicine which is used. And then fragrant orchids are there. And even the orchid tea is also being prepared. The chawar grass, which is uh, one of the important things. And then uh, bouquets and all that, they are prepared. So I was in uh, various countries, so I just wanted to again show the orchid that no, it's not orchid science which is important and amazing. Even now, this is through the world. Yes? Five minutes. We are running okay. short of time. So, uh, people are now would like to have anything which is uh, orchidaceous, you know, they would like to possess. So, this is a goat's orchid embroidery, the ladies wear it. Even the embroidery on the sweaters, they would like to have, anybody would like to have the precious crockery with the orchid designs. And the clusters with the live orchid flowers which have been there. Even the pendants, all kind of pendants, mercy. This is in Singapore, you know, with all kind of orchid flower designs. Even the ladies, ladies is applying the spray with the, you know, that I can sleep well. So there are a large number of sprays, you know, which have been prepared from the orchid products. Even keychains, designers, posters, the small kits, posters, even the jewelry. Even this is one of the lady of the president of the World Orchid Conference. Even the food which is served during a national and international conference which is decorated with orchid flowers. So this is I was one of the judges for various international orchid exhibitions and various conferences. I just wanted uh, the students to just admire the variety uh, of the orchids, the, how it was decorated at the international level. So these are the orchid displays, you know, which were depicted by various countries there. So each and every corner, you know, can be... Uh, with the landscaping and all that, it can be beautifully decorated with beautiful orchids. So with different countries, how they have displayed their diversity. These are one of the judges with me. So here, even the, to the students, you know, to the very beginning, they have been talking about the orchid diversity. So this is also one of the judges from me, from Miami. This is, a, this is not a painting, actually. These are original flowers which have been there. These are tissue culture plants which are being, you know, uh, given and the young, uh, so very uh, students, you know, at the very uh, children at the very uh, maybe from the age to four to you know ten years, they have brought the uh, orchids, you know. And this is one of the very important orchids, which is uh, uh, called two orchid. It was not there, it was a big orchid on this pursuit of two orchid, one produced it in China, but later on, there's a exactly much better price saying that was inserted not uh, this uh, uh, origin, you know. So you can see these are the scientists in uh, uh, Japan, Okinawa, Japan, and these two uh, scientists claim that they have produced this blue orchid, which was never in the world. So, but the, because of the beauty and utility, you know, they are, uh, I mean, um, they are like, overexploited, their landslides, soil erosion, and all that, so all the coral are endangered. But all the orchid, orchid plants are in appendix two, and uh, the ten are in appendix one. So you can see where we used to collect the orchids. Now the, the land is in bad shape because of that's why there's a lot of grazing going on. Uh, there's not land uh, road construction. Of course, the government of India is uh, doing a lot of effort for that. Forest reserve, national parks, orchid sanctuaries, but they are uh, not. To that level, tissue culture techniques are working good. We have produced in our laboratory about protocols of about more than 100 orchid species using different experts. I will show how we have uh, like bypassed the fungal environment and given the information we have produced the plant, we have transferred to the, you know, uh, again, natural conditions. And then we are using different alternating agents. Even on different cheap selling agents, we have been used. Cost effective protocols we have been produced. And uh, propagation, we have been using different explants, root leaf explants, root explants, and so on. And finally, you know, we have transferred uh, synthetic technology we have perfected in our lab and had to figure through our devices, and we have shifted them to the lab. And we have also perfected in some microarray functions so that they can grow well and we have put on the land in the forest and we got growing well. 
There are many objects with name that are famous. Natari, Shakti, Margaret, Nelson Mandela, and all that. And the Vemta Bachchan, Shah Rukh Khan, and latest, I would like to share that one of the objects has been named after me. Mila Patek Bhai, which is had to do this in RHS, this Royal Horticulture Society, London. And there are many of the name of Dr. Modi and all that. And in the India, there are national state powers, is often done. And their promotion program, we have done this kind of India, we have been doing all these programs to create a business for people. And we are the Journal of Dr. Society of India, we publish a newsletter. We are organizing this international conference in various regions in the country, you know, so that we can create a business as a mass level in the country. So this is all about uh, the national conference, this international conference we organize at Chandigarh. We have published so far with the orchids. And this is the National Journal of Art. So look at the title and look at it. This is public. Harmony and Prosperity. And I always, whenever I see this orchid, I always find that this is smiling on me as if I have no I have not, uh, for the last 35 years on this plant, but I am still ignorant about this plant. So we strive to understand, popularize, conserve, and propagate orchids. Thank you. I would like to, the students to become life member of the orchid society in case they are interested. Any any, uh, any person who is a member of the orchid society of India. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you are welcome if any questions. I have one question. Yeah, please. We are here uh, in the area bordering Nepal. So at yeah. the border of India and Nepal, that is Bihar and Nepal, uh, yes. we have a place called Mansotha. And four, five hundred years back, there was a king called Raja Salhesh. And there is Salhesh Burwari at that place. It is a type of secret grove, and uh, there is a practice every year around 14th June, uh, 14th June, that is Vaishak Sankranti. That lakhs of people they throng together at that place, and there is an orchid called Dendrobium epila or epilum like that. That uh, it is said that it flowers on that very day, and people throng there to see to go and see that flower. There is called love, love flower. And I think uh, there is a tree called, called haram, haram. On that haram plant, it grows. This, this uh, orchid flower grows. Is there any host specificity? And what are the other details of dendrobium epila you would like to know from me? Dendrobium epila, or perhaps this is the orchid there. On a plant called haram, perhaps it is dystrophia, Javanica. It has got much cultural importance in this area. That's the case. Am I audible? Am I audible? <coughs> No, no, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible now? No, sir, you are not audible. No, should I repeat it? Should I repeat it? Should I repeat it? Hello, sir, Hello. your voice is not clear to me. Hello? 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 Uh, am I audible? Uh, you are audible. Am, am I audible? I, whether I am audible yes, or not? Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yes, you are audible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, thank you so much for your question. I think this is a very, very appropriate question, sir. Yes.
है ना वीडियो कॉल कॉल नेटवर्क तो तो मैं कहूँगी आप कहाँ Yes, sir. Good morning. I am ready. Yeah, I am ready. Hope I am audible. Am I audible? Hello. 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 He has nine years of research experience and one book chapter to his credit, and he is also alumni of this uh, department, Department of Biotechnology, Department of Biology. So welcome, Ashni. We are eager to hear you. But Am I audible? Within fifteen minutes. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, let me share my slide. Let me share my slide. Yeah. Please share your slide. Yeah, I am sharing my slide. Please. Can you see my slide? Is it moving properly, right? Correct. Okay. So good noon to everyone. Uh, I mean, I'm feeling nostalgic that uh, it's a matter of my alma mater. Honorable uh, head of the department, Professor Jamil, Professor uh, Indranath Mishra, uh, Dr. Gopal, other dignitaries on the desk. I thank you very much for inviting me, uh, the team who has been working day and night to organize this seminar. Uh, it could be good for me to be there physically, due to, but due to I am requesting, please uh, mute others mic. It is disturbing a lot. If it is possible, please mute others mic. Please speak loudly, Ashwini ji. Yeah. So it's a matter of pride for me that I am delivering the lecture from where I have been nurtured. And all credit goes to Professor Indranath Mishra, whatever I am today. The journey was not easy. It was very difficult, but yes. Uh, what I am today that I am, and journey is starting from Mithila University. So anybody can start from journey from there and can go anywhere if you are desirous to go. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, currently, I am serving as an assistant professor, Department of Environmental Studies, and as an hello. Is uh, uh, Dr. Gopal introduced that my area of research, so what of area of research that we are also working on the climate change policy. Briefly, uh, regarding that, what uh, changing atmospheric composition impacts. So it's impacting our health and planet health also. And what are the challenges regarding the environment? Is the pollution, climate change, ozone depletion, other bioaccumulative toxic material accumulations, and many more uh, challenges are there. If you look into the challenges and you will try to connect them. And usually we come at the point where there is a need to rescue, either it is human health or environmental health. So we always talk about that, how will you solve the problem of pollution, how will you rescue from the climate change, how will you rescue from the food security. So uh, I mean, it's a com compatible to your, uh, to your conference that food security issue is that, and that is greatly related to the climate change. So there is a Dipser framework. Uh, by UNEP, and that Dipser framework says about the driver pressure, state impact, and then response. Usually, we talk at the response level. So, driver is those factors which creates the pressure in the form of emissions. Since it's atmospheric health related to that, so I'm talking about the pressure is actually the emissions, and that creates a state of the pollution, climate change, ozone depletion, and others. And it impacts our health and planet health. And then we talk about the response. 
in terms of the many things. So we will be talking about that. Existing policies increasingly need to be assessed in terms of how they address the drivers and impacts of environmental challenges. So main drivers which we need to talk about and we need to address that are categorized under five major headings. The drivers due to which this climate change have been happening and the atmospheric health has been deteriorating are the population growth, urbanization, economic development, new technological forces and climate change. And all these drivers are responsible for energy production, transport, industry, residual waste, agricultural waste, natural anthropogenic waste, and these all religious emissions. And that emissions are the main culprit of the climate change. So first driver is the population growth, and we never talk about that in terms of climate change. So you can see over the graph how fast population has been increasing, and it's a predicted up to 2050, it will be up to 10 billion population. So from 1950 to 250, you can see how fast population has been growing. So if the question comes at what it do, it's high consumption, it increases consumption on the limited resources. Because resource is limited and we are not controlling pollution. So growth in terms of the per capita income is also slower. It created inequality and these all increases the carbon footprint. So due to the population growth and other demographic dynamics, it is very difficult to decouple this unsustainable environmental practice due to several reasons like the consumptions, resource utilizations, inequalities and others. If you look into the urbanizations, everybody wants to shift towards the urban areas. If you look at the graph, you will find that how urban population is increasing day by day. And we are not able to control it. It is perfectly fine that we want to shift towards the urban population, urban side. But you look into that. If you look into your city and you will wonder to see that everything is unplanned. Either it's infrastructure, it's a traffic, it's a vehicle, everything is unplanned. So when things will go in unplanned way, then how can you talk about the sustainable development? Currently, this, currently, I'm talking very globally, the currently more than half of the world population is living in the urban area. It's a predicted to increase by 60 to 70 percent up to 2050. And everything is going unplanned. Now, what if it's going unplanned, so means that pattern of urban physical infrastructure is unplanned, land use pattern is unplanned, transportation, energy demand, biodiversity loss, water infrastructure, socio-spatial disparity, and these all going unplanned way. So outcome of those urbanization, unplanned urbanization is the lack of access to basic service, pollution, public, poor public transport, heat effect, ill health, inform, informal settlements, lack of affordability and waste, and all these generate a huge, huge amount of greenhouse gases, and that is the main culprit of the climate change. Now economic development. So third factor, third driver for all these climate change issues is economic development and meeting up the basic human needs for the access of food, education, water. For the physical infrastructure, we need housing, energy, transport, and communication, environmental health, social equity, poverty eradication. So social developmental goals, which includes environmental sustainability, are derived from broader concept of economy. This economic development is required for the development of society, but we need to think in a way that how much sustainable that economic development is. So economic development, I mean, in the environmental, environmentally sustainable economic development has many challenges. Challenges are the political will power, conflict in federal structure. Every day basis now, you know, kind of the social media who could look into conflict of that, how federal structure is having the conflict. The state blames to center, center blames to state, state blames to municipal corporation, gram panchayat. So all these conflicts has been happening. The commitment of the government to their own land and the lack of transparency in environmental federal structure. These all things led to the unsustainable practice of the economic development. Technology and innovation, the way and the, and the, and, and the rate by which this technological innovation should be there to combat the climate change and the pollution control is not there. Only few of the countries have been adapting the low carbon technologies now out of approximately 200 countries who are the part of those uh, climate change policies practice. If you look at the climate change, so it is one of the independent drivers of the environmental change, and it is multi-century, two-time scale. You look into the one data, you will find that the carbon dioxide emission from 750 to 1970 is a 200, it is 220 years, 
and it was in 220 years it was 9 10 gigaton but from 1970 to 2010 it is just in 40 years it is 1000 gigaton and the richest 10% of the country 10% of the population and it's 50% of the total greenhouse gas emission while the poorest 50% emits only 10% but usually and those 10% comes from the developed nations and those developed nations blames to the developing country among which these 50% you know, lie so this blame games you know are creating a lot of issues in that so to keep a good chance of staying below 2 degree c which is a main culprit of the climate change the global warming is happening i mean emissions should drop by 40 to 70% globally by 2050 and falling to the net zero by 2100 so this is our requirement we are country we are somehow you know managing those uh, those comparatively uh, increasing temperature to combat the global warming and many other countries are also but most of the developed nations are not com- having to comply with that carbon emissions so this this emission about which we are talking the drivers which are generating these emissions due to the two main challenges anthropogenic and natural and anthropogenic is the major one i told you the drivers are the population urbanization economic activities climate change and all those now this is the one of the wonderful slide you can look into that data and you will find that in anthropogenic sources electricity fuel production which is under control of the government generates 70% of the carbon dioxide 71% of sulfur dioxide 72% of nitrous nitrogen oxide and fossil fuel is still dominate the global power system electricity demand is expected to increase by 2/3 by 2040 transport industrial residential waste management agriculture and forestry so these all comes under the anthropogenic sources and these sources generates a lot of the power and that causing the climate change you look into this slide you will find that 39.3% approximately 40% contribution comes due to the electricity generation population is increasing so demand of electricity is increasing and still majority of the population majority of the electricity generation depends on fossil fuel so need to think in terms of the other energy sources for the electricity generation this creates a state and that is state air pollution pops stratospheric ozone depletion ultraviolet radiation and climate change so this is a straight due to driver it generate the state of the air pollution and this is slide which is saying about that how you know at the middle part you see that these all emission sources having uh, are changing to the climate system and having impact and the food security is one of the aspect and that is that has been un- impacted by this climate change and emissions global warming is threat to farmers so it is said it's a bilateral i mean the farming is both driver of the climate change and victim is also victim also so the demand of the food is increasing day by day but production is decreasing day by day and it is expected to decrease a lot up to 2050 so that is a great challenge so impact is on the human health and plant health all i i talked about that due to time limitation i am not going in detail about that but the matter of the matter of happiness and the pride is that some global success has been happening like the implementation of the carbon pricing low carbon technologies there are approximately 1200 carbon 1200 climate change and climate change relevant laws worldwide are existing and people are and globally it has been implemented by the year 2040 renewable energy will constitute two third of the global investment in the power generation solar energy including india will become the largest source of global low carbon capacity key low carbon technology like solar wind has proven the game changing in all these you know uh, driver issues india has its own commitment and they have the total five commitments to achieve the net carbon zero emissions up to 2070 lot has been done and lot has been you know in the process of uh, complying those commitments continuously so one of the now we must talk about what are the solution for that is there is a food security food insecurity we are decreasing we are not getting the sufficient food due to the climate change issues so what are the solution for that that we need to look, look into that so there is a two emerging i mean the two main solution is that one we need to change our behavior we change to lifestyle that government of india prime minister modi launched in 2021 
in COP26, the lifestyle for the environment. And this is related globally to everyone. Everyone means everyone. We have to change our attitude towards the environment. We have to change our attitudes towards, you know, for the sake of the environment. But, but it may take, you know, time. So other probable solution is the policy and governance approach. The policy approach is many, like the planning regime is one of the policy, technology emissions standard is one of the policy, market intervention is other policy, information policy, international cooperation is a policy. So these are the key policies issues for the government side that could be done to achieve the sustainable development and to reduce the emissions and to combat the climate change. These are the few case studies for the students I have given on the slide. They can go and explore these case studies that how successful these policies are. Like the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Islands, energy and climate policy is very successful. Diesel emissions in Europe, that was combated and it is a very good policy implemented. In our country, Ujwala and LDSP in India implemented uh, by the name of the, uh, for the people of the Pilo Poverty Line, but it has huge impact in combating the emissions. I mean, the information policy now we all are aware about that, what is the AQI of our city, and that comes under information policies. So, if people will get aware about that, then we will be able to fight the problem. One of the most important aspects globally, the international cooperation happened in terms of the ozone depleting substances, and the rescuing of the ozone hole has been happening, and we have rescued a lot. And that ozone depleting substance was replaced almost 95 to 99% from the fuel or the sources where those ozone depleting substances were there. And this came by, by the international cooperation. So policy is another issue. I mean, but, but making the policy and implementation is other aspect. So, I mean, let me talk about the two key, two key case studies like Ujula scheme. I told you that Ujula effect, a lot of studies have been happening and going on that how it is helping in reducing the emission sources and combating the uh, climate change. Second case study is demand side management in India, affordable LED scheme launched by Prime Modi. And it says that it was helpful in reducing 3 million tons of the carbon dioxide. Shwaksh Bharat mission is one of the important case studies that is very helpful in, in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, solid waste management. So making the policy at a larger scale and adopting the lifestyle by the individual globally will be very helpful in, in, in reducing the emissions. Otherwise, it's very impossible if you talk about the technology. So come, I mean, the bringing technology is very time consuming. And if technology comes, it's just so fast, you know, it, it has a huge cost in the initial stage. So it takes a longer time. But these two aspects is very important that implementation of the change in behavior at the individual level and side by side from bringing policy from the government is one of the key aspects and it is one of the probable solution to combat the emissions and the climate change. What we need to do specifically if you talk about the country, this is not related to India only, it's a conflict everywhere all globally. But specifically, we look at the India that there is a lot of federal conflicts. Either if you, if you look at the political federalism or environmental federalism, at the both the places there are a lot of conflicts. So we always blame to each other. There is a lack of the transparency in the environmental federalism. I mean, the one agency is blames to another agency. So all, all agency need to look and work in a very transparent manner. And also, all the federal government system which we have on countries existing, we need to talk very transparently, very honestly, and things will go in the right directions. So the conclusion is that internationally agreed environmental goals are not expected to achieve in near future due to the current progress rate. It's a very, very slow progress rate. And this is the report of UNDP. So we need to be faster in that aspect to achieve that internationally agreed environmental goal. Current pattern of consumption production inequality are not sustainable. We need to look into that so that we need, we will have to look into the pressure of what we are generating in terms of climate change. Projected population growth, urbanization, all these driving impact, we need to look into that to, 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 to facilitate the demand of the natural resources and the food security, energy, water. And we, have, we should have some commitment at the individual level and the government level, and then we will be able to achieve those goals. And also the policy, one policy is not sufficient. 
So policy approach must be adapted to a specific context. Like I told you, the policy for the Bihar can be different, for the UP can be different, for India can be different, for US can be different. For India can be different. For, so, I mean, the regional policy uh, can be different and state-wide policy can be different and, 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 and the country-level policy can be different. So, UNAP also talk about the national policy. The national policy is not that one global policy comes and it will be effective for uh, all the countries around the globe. It's not like that. Equally important in the country also, one, if a policy comes at the country level, it will be effective at all parts of the country. It's not that. So, all the federal structure, federal government should work. All the, like, if there is a gram panchayat, gram panchayat should uh, bring some policy at their own local level. The state should bring some policy at their own state level. And then central government should bring some policy for you know the, around the country. So, so according to the manner of unity, all governments should work. So policy is one of the key aspects, and the change in the human behavior is another aspect. Thank you very much, uh, 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 team, to invite me for delivering lectures due to the paucity of time. And uh, I discussed with Professor Mishra regarding the audience. I wanted to tell something to the students, so I made slides according to that. I didn't want to talk too much technically, so that I mean I understand uh, the audience there. That's why I made a very you know very simple slide for the student and hope that the student could have a benefit. I'm very thankful for the Department of Naval Studies, University of Delhi, JNU who nurtured me in the PhD, NIH who funded for the civil uh, several uh, research aspect, IOE, New Delhi, DHR, ICMR, and lastly to the Mithila University organizing team and uh, uh, Professor uh, and Professor Mishra, other team members. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a matter of pride. It's a matter of pride for me to be there, but I'm sorry I could not be there physically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashwini, for your time. Very good presentation. Very useful for the students and the teachers. I would like, I would like, do you have any questions from the audience? Do you have push, question for Ashwini from the audience? He helps from our department, he is very happy to answer your queries or clarifications. If not, Gopalji has a question for you. Sasriji, you have mentioned that population or growth rate is mainly responsible for this. Climatic change and other things. So nowadays people are considering that uh, this population growth rate is uh, good for economic growth. As you have seen in China and India, because growth rate is good, so we are growing rapidly than European and American countries. But how can you justify? Yeah, that's a good question. Gopal he raised the question. He, I think Gopal he is basically from the JNU, so <laughs> it's always. <laughs> good question here. Uh, and he brings all the good questions. Uh, you see, uh, this, is, this is the good in the terms of what you were asking. The population is required for the economic development. But economic development should be sustainable enough. And that sustainable, sustainability cannot be achieved if there will be conflict. If, if the government want to bring some population, you know, the bill, then conflict is started. Government want to bring the bill to look into the how sustainable that population should be. It's not that you have to stop the population growth. You have to look into the growth that should be sustainable. On the basis of the availability of the resource, you have to look into that. It's not that you know the, every family needs to have to produce the 10 children or 20 children. You have to look into that how sustainable it is according to the availability of the resources. So that comes of compatibility, we need to look into that. And according to the policy should be framed and that should be implemented, which is very difficult. It's not easy because a lot of issues come a lot of you know the federal conflicts happens, so that is a political issue also. But my concern is that that policy should come, policy should come that should be sustainable enough as per the availability of the resources. That is my main concern. Thank you. Uh, I gave a student an example for us. There is a there is Ashwini who has started as a student from this department and now is a, a proud. Hello, for all of us, he is assistant professor in Delhi University. It is a matter of place like all of us. He is standing ovation to Ashwini Rai. Uh, let me let me finish sir one line. Let me tell me that whatever I am today, that is due to Professor Misra. He induced me, he nurtured me, he guided me, and he told me that you are a JNU material. JNU material. You leave the Banga, go to the JNU. I followed the path and I achieved whatever I am. But my commitment for the student that I will come there and we meet physically to all of you, all of you. This is my commitment. Very soon I am coming there. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you, sir.
Thank you for blessings always. What did you? Uh, yes, sir. A very good afternoon to everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible, and we welcome you all. Uh, you. So, presently, Dr. Shivam Yadav is an assistant professor at the Department of Botany, Allahabad University. Earlier, he has been that fellow, Germany. Uh, he is a variety of interest in organ biology. Uh, he has been the one who gets up this kind of experience. Uh, so, uh, he has been the one who sets out here and the print book kept that in this place. In fact, generally, people they are confused that whether you are C or D. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. I hope I'm audible. Yes, and I thank uh, I thank the organizing committee for providing me this opportunity to present here, and I'm very thankful to uh, Professor Indranath Mishra, sir, as I have met also uh, Mr. at Patitra University, and uh, I am sharing my uh, slides. Uh, I hope the presentation is visible to everyone. Yes, So, uh, the title of uh, my topic is today basically on the uh, cyanobacterial cyclophilin proteins, and uh, particularly one of them, which is uh, CYP40, which regulates the photosystem assembly and the uh, association of cytobelism on the thalicoid membranes. So, uh, coming to the next slide, um, at present day, the use of agriculture, uh, the chemical biofertilizer, it, it is a global concern to everyone. Although we are, being, uh, we are using them anonymously without uh, any uh, uh, checking, and uh, therefore, in terms of that, the cyanobacterial biofertilizers, they are an excellent alternative to chemical biofertilizer, uh, chemical fertilizer, because they are due to their uh, sustainable nature, because uh, they can sustain. And, um, and the reason why they are an excellent alternative for chemical fertilizers is the presence of heterocysts where the nitrogen fixation takes place. Apart from that, uh, apart from this intrinsic capability of nitrogen fixation, they are also involved in release of several amino acids like alanine, vitamin B12 and oxalic substances. And uh, they are also involved in solubilization of insoluble phosphates which are present in soil. And also the agropolysaccharide which is released uh, or which is secreted uh, by them binds the soil particles and Can increases you show the... Full slide, madam? Sorry, sir? Full slide mode. Not in full oh. time, I think. Yes. Yes. So, uh, this exopolysaccharide it helps in uh, increasing the size of the soil. So, in my previous lab, we were working basically on the proteomics and transcriptomics of uh, biofertilizer, uh, the cyanobacteria, in association with several abiotic stresses. Because along with the rice paddy fields, they are also experiencing those abiotic stresses. So, uh, the transcriptomics and the proteomics data, it suggests that there are certain key metabolic pathways which are either upregulated or downregulated down in response to stress. Basically, the signal transduction pathways, some photosynthesis and metabolism related proteins, and uh, specifically the oxidative stress markers. So, out of those proteins, several proteins have been confirmed with a uh, prominent role in stress tolerance. For example, the uh, HSP60 family protein, the aldo keto reductases, some superoxide dismutases, and also the glyoxylase. One promising, uh, there are several actually promising candidates like uh, thioridoxins, catalases, but I focused on some cyclophilins and. Uh, So basically, cyclophilin are the ubiquitous proteins which are present throughout uh, all the organisms, uh, starting from bacteria up to the mammals, including plants, fungi, 
almost in all domain of the life. They are uh, involved in some protein trafficking and maturation in the risk assembly, in the spliceosome assembly, as well as in refolding of aggregated protein. Apart from that, in plants, they are specifically involved in regulation of phosphorylation of photophotons two components. This is a study from Wang et al. Uh, which was published in 2015 in Frontiers in Plant Sciences. And what they proposed that this protein, which is uh, uh, this uh, cyclophilin 38, it is involved in dephosphorylation of D1 protein under high light condition. Under high light condition, the RNAs it uh, initiates a signal transaction pathway which leads to upregulation of cyclophilin 38. And this particularly inhibits the uh, dephosphorylation of D1 protein and thus the D1 degradation is also inhibited. So in a way, it is protecting the plants against high light stress. However, the central question to this research uh, was originated from this one because in cyanobacteria, the uh, phosphorylation of D1 protein is not observed till now. So why does the cyanobacterial cyclophilins they are present and uh, why they uh, uh, demonstrate the stress responsive accumulate? And in the absence of phosphorylation events, what could be its function? And whether they are associated with thylakoid or play any role in assembly of photosynthetic complexes? So to answer this question, the study was uh, performed. We did some in silico analysis and we found that the protein is having a transmembrane domain followed by two domains, uh, one domain of unknown function and the C-terminal domain which is a cyclophilin TLP like protein. And the phylogenetic analysis showed that the protein, uh, uh, the cyanobacterial cyclophilins, they basically comes under this, uh, uh, this uh, the plant cyclophilins. They are closely related to the plant cyclophilins. Uh, because uh, earlier studies were done uh, for proteomics and we found that the protein was expressed under various abiotic stresses. So we followed a, we uh, followed to that, we performed a transcript, on, uh, transcript analysis of the protein under several stresses and we found that the protein was maximally upregulated in the salt stress. So to further confirm this, uh, the gene was heterologously expressed in E. coli and we found that uh, we performed some stress tolerance assays and we found that the uh, strains which are overexpressing the protein, they were growing properly as compared to those which are expressing the empty plasmid. As you can see here, in the lower panel of all these four uh, figures, you can see the uh, those cells which are expressing the protein, they are growing properly under various concentrations of stress. To further confirm that in, in uh, cyanobacteria, we created a single recombinant mutant and uh, as you can see here, the mutant was named AFSI NRCY2 protein and you can see these two um, uh, strains were used and we found that uh, the mutants were unable to grow under high salt concentration. So, uh, one can conclude that the protein is required for cyanobacterial stress response and more specifically for the salt stress response. So, uh, and the same uh, study was performed in liquid culture and here uh, I'm showing the growth curve also. You can see in uh, orange is the mutant with showing defect in the growth. So, all these uh, studies, it only us to find out interesting partners in the cell to confirm its function in the uh, in the cyanobacteria. For that, we performed the pull down assay where a scrap tag uh, tag protein was expressed in vivo, and pull down assay was done through affinity chromatography, and we found around 64 proteins which were categorized into three uh, different categories. Basically, the major chunk of proteins were from ribosome and RNA polymerase. The reason behind that could be that the protein cyclophilins basically they are peptidyl proteins response isomerase. So uh, they are involved in the folding of the proteins also. So apart from uh, just after transcription, they are also involved in protein folding. Therefore, we got a lot of proteins from uh, this uh, ribosome assembly. Then the second category was the putative substrates, which could be because of this uh, cis-trans isomerase activity, we found that high proline concentration was present in this putative substrate. But apart from that, the third category was, interestingly, the proteins from photosynthetic uh, complexes. 
which are uh, uh, shown here in the table from photosystem 2, from photosystem 1, and uh, from phycobiosomes. So this this uh, study gave us a clue of the role in uh, of the protein in the uh, photo photosynthesis, and therefore uh, the phenotypic analysis of mutants under high light stress was also performed. And here you can see the uh, there was a significant growth reduction, and apart from that, the chlorophyll distribution, oxygen evolution, and the maximum uh, photochemical quantum yield was also uh, significantly reduced in the mutant strains under high light stress. We also performed a blue uh, native uh, BN page and we found that uh, the protein under control, uh, sorry, uh, the, the NRN uh, species, which is a wild type, here you can see the assembly of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 dimer was uh, appropriate, but, uh, whereas in the mutants, you can see the photosystem 1 and 2 dimers are almost lost or they are at a very uh, low concentration. So uh, this, this, this says that photosystem 1 and 2 is affected in the mutants under normal condition as well as in the high light. I hope I am audible. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, sir, can you hear me? Please go ahead. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. yes. Then afterwards, uh, because we found an interaction with photosystem components with phycobilisomes, we performed uh, another study in which we um, uh, used the cell I said and uh, separated or differentiated about 10 to 50 percent gradient, and these all fractions were subjected to SDS phase followed by Western blotting. Here you can see the protein, uh, it is also present in the PBS component as well as in the thylakoid um, uh, uh, fraction, where the thylakoid membrane is basically present. We, we have used an antibody positive control at uh, PSPA antibody. So, to specifically confirm it again, we isolated the phycobilisomes and uh, we used another antibody which is against Anabina TIC22, which is a periplasmic protein. And we found that the protein, as expected, uh, TIC22 was present only in the cell lysate, non and not in the uh, phycobilisome component. However, the cyclophilin, the antibody specific to the cyclophilin, it showed abundance in the phycobilisome fraction which further confirms the interaction with phycobilisomes. So, uh, to confirm the study, we also developed a robust method uh, of super-resolution imaging in cyanobacteria for the first time. And uh, we overlaid uh, the, through DNA paint method. And we uh, here you can see the signals, individual signals of the protein, of the thylakoid membrane, and of the plasma membrane. And this is the overlay. If we compare the profile of all these three overlays, uh, we will find, uh, you can see here, in blue is the cyclophilin, in the orange is uh, the thylakoid membrane, and the green is for uh, this plasma uh, membrane. So the thylakoid and uh, uh, the protein fluorescence, uh, they uh, overlap properly and prove that the protein localizes to the thylakoid membrane. To further, uh, finally, functionally uh, reduce the uh, proper function of the protein in the cell. We also performed the crystal X ray crystallography and the protein well, structure was shown. We are yes. running short of time. Please conclude within five minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm trying my best. I will, I will try to finish it soon. So, uh, and the protein was uh, functionally active also as we did the enzyme assays. And the protein was crystallized, crystallized under different conditions. These are the beautiful crystals that I got after uh, X ray crystallography. Uh, and these conditions were picked up and the structure was solved using uh, molecular replacement method. And here, as you see, it has a C-terminal um, helical domain, which is shown here in blue, and cyclophilin domain, which has a distorted beta barrel, and it is, uh, uh, it is having two alpha homicides on the top and the bottom. What was very interesting in the, in the, after, after uh, reducing the structure, that the protein which is found, the homolog which is found in plants, it has a long root and therefore the 
enzymatic activity of that protein is hampered and it is not at all enzymatically uh, active. However, the protein which is present in cyclophilin, the same homolog, it is enzymatically active. So by structure, we deduce that. So uh, to summarize uh, the, uh, the results, what we uh, show that the cyclophilin from cyanobacteria, and Abina PC7120, it is an enzyme with a dual function. It has a role in general stress responses, specifically to salinity stress response. And also, uh, it interacts with the photosystem complexes and somehow regulates the photosynthesis. So, uh, based on the interacting partners and based on the cavity between the cytotactics between the photosystem, we uh, propose this hypothetical model. In green, you can see this is the protein which I studied, and this is the blue the cytosine flow. And these are the photosystem 2 and 1 diamonds. And we play here on the basis of the interactive residues found after all the studies. And the work has been already published in Nature Communications in 2022. So this is, I thank and I acknowledge uh, my alma mater, Vinichu, and the fellowship which was given by DART uh, for continuing my research in Germany, the Goethe University and the Max Planck Institute for Biophysics. Thank you, Dr. Seba. Thank you, Dr. Seba. Thank you, sir. Now, we can have a question. Any audience have any questions? So, thank you, Ava. You have presented very well, and you have oh, see, sorry. Uh, and your your uh, talk is matching with my work also, molecular aspect. So, you have shown oligomerization only by rheumatic phase or any other protein-protein interaction that you have used for showing oligomerization of your protein. But there are so many. Uh, Protein protein interaction techniques are available like fold down assay, protein of precipitation. That will be more authentic than this. So I, I, did, I did the pull down assay. Well, I generated the strain and with a strep tag and then through affinity purification, I pulled down the uh, proteins which are interacting with the uh, cyclophilin 40. Thank you. And for this page uh, also, we have used uh, uniform concentration of gradient phase. So you have shown 669 kilo dollar so in, in uniform concentration it's not possible to capture that kilo dollar protein. Uh, sir, Again, uh, I cannot, uh, the question is not very clear to me. The question is, like, question yes. is that we have used gradient page for showing that high molecular weight protein or simple page, a blue native page. Simple means concentration of this jade was homogeneous, uniform throughout the bottom to uh, the top, or it is changing. So for, for blue native page, I use a gradient uh, page. Yes. Yes. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Thank you, Arvind. Okay. Now there is an for the dedicate and the student. आप लोग में से वैसे लोग जो पूरा प्रेजेंटेशन करने वाले हो वो अपना नाम और रेंज सीधी को दीजिए और ये लंच के बाद होगा 2:30 के बाद होगा जिनको पोस्टर प्रेजेंटेशन करना है उनसे अनुरोध है वो डिपार्टमेंट में चले जाएं बॉर्डर डिपार्टमेंट में और जो निर्धारित जगह है वहां अपना पोस्टर लगाएं लंच के वक्त में एक्सपर्ट्स जाके वहां देखेंगे और Hello, Serif, are you here? Dr. Serif? Hello. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, Terry. Yes. Okay. So, Terry is uh, a faculty at the Department of Plant Biology, University of Nigeria. His area of research interests are 
ethnobotany, phytochemistry, phytomedicine. He has 30 research articles to conference proceedings and three book chapters to his credit. And he has done his PhD partially from India. So welcome, Sadiq. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, which has my presentation. I'm not joining with my laptop because uh, I'm every storm in Nigeria. And uh, Dr. Gopal, I think I'm not able to share my screen. Should I send my screen to you, my PowerPoint to you? Are you seeing something? PowerPoint. Are you seeing? Are you seeing? Are you seeing any screen? Please. Can Can you mail? Can you mail your PPT? Yes. Can, can, can you see this? Can you see this screen? Yes. Yes. Hello. Can you yes. see it? Yes. Yes. Now it's good. Please proceed. It's good, Daddy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Good morning. Uh, yeah, it's morning here, actually. It's around uh, tonight here in Nigeria. I'm uh, Sharif from University of Learning Nigeria. I will be presenting on polymeric nanoparticles for enhanced delivery and improved activities of essential oils. Introduction. There are some sources of Switzerland sent essential oil in the 16th century after being produced from medicine quintessential. essential. Essential oils are volatile, naturally occurring chemicals with potent odors that aromatic plants produce as a byproduct of their secondary metabolism. These essential oils are extracted from aromatic plants, which are found in temperate, warm, and tropical regions where they form a vital component of the ancient pharmacopoeia. Significant amounts of uh, essentials are discovered in oil sacks and uh, several other parts of plants, like fruit peels and leaves. Essentials are used in aromatherapy uh, because they have a natural healing person's mind. Also, many, many ancient organizations have used aromatherapy as a popular and sought after complementary analytic uh, therapy for about 6,000 years. Essential oils are administered in small quantity via various methods such as inhalation, uh, massage, simple application in the skin, but really taken internally. Uh, the, uh, several therapy classes have been employed in treating various disease conditions, which include cosmetic aromatherapy, massage aromatherapy, medical aromatherapy, olfactory aromatherapy, and type aromatherapy. Essential oil can be classified based on their chemical composition, extraction methods, and aroma that's present therein. The class of essential uh, oils based on chemical composition is subject to the plants where they are found. For instance, uh, the oil from citrus or pine contain a carbon. And from other plants also, they have the classes like that. So let's just continue. But activity of essential oil. Essential oils have in scientific phase, persisted in relevance due to their flexibility and usefulness and the increasing clamor for natural products. Essential oils are composed mainly of tapinoids, and non tapenoid compounds, which give their characteristic aroma. Uh, the bioactivity exhibited by these oils is solely due to one of the main components, which is an uh, active component of the essential oil. In the essential oil, uh, they, have, they have been used as antioxidant, antimicrobial, echinocidal, phytotoxic and as anti cancer agents, which make them one of the sort of uh, for treatment of diseases. The nanotechnology now, polymeric nanoparticles. Uh, as we know, nanotechnology is fast evolving and leads to very significant technological advancement in many areas, such as chemistry, 
material sciences, engineering, and medicine. And specifically, uh, for medical applications, different types of particles have been exploited for enhancing drug uh, delivery. They are used in organic, lipid based, polymeric, uh, and polymeric nanoparticles offer superior advantage of being accessible to functionalize ability to release encapsulated compounds as a controlled rate and proper action on specific sites. And uh, driven by that significant uh, of techno uh, technology in medicine in the past few years, the adoption of polymeric particles has played a, a crucial role as a therapeutic strategy for developing several medicinal agents. This is due to their efficacy and variability and the enhancement of drug administration. They, they are easily integrated into biological matrices and they are actively used to transport to the target site of action with specified concentration, stability, and more extended activity period especially for volatile active agents. Thus, uh, nanoparticles are considered an ideal candidate for efficient drug delivery. Uh, formulation of any nano drug depends on the choice of suitable polymer based on factors such as maximum recapitulation of uh, efficiency, retention time, uh, variability of inter uh, an enhancement of intercellular penetration, applicability, safety, biocompatibility, and cost. The structure of the system is formulated as nano capsule, nano sphere, nano elliptoid, and over nanoparticle, polymeric micellar, polyplex, and nanoparticles. No polyplex nanoparticles. Polymer nanoparticles have also been grouped based on formulation into sizes and shapes, as micelles, uh, particles, stars, inorganic polymer hybrids. Based on their ab ab absorptivity, PMPs are categorized as biodegradable and non biodegradable polymers, and many more. Natural biodegradable polymers uh, or polymer nanoparticles. Uh, they are adjacent to natural occurring materials uh, from during the cycle of living organism, such as uh, grape plant, animal bacteria, and fungi. Owing to their limited associated uh, risk of non biodiversity here it is like low after absolute and low biodiversity in the body matrices. Body community for expression, ability, and information reaction. But the PMP remain more active because not by the available DAVI is being talked to the system. So we tend to use the biodegradable one, which are from the natural uh, substance. These are the schematic illustration of the PMP in the form of the nanosphere. Nanocapsule, polymeric micelles, and polyplex. Synthetic approach, approach to nanoparticles. The method selection of particulated PMP depends on physical and chemical properties of interest and the applications. The preparation methods have been categorized to two, both based on polymerization of monomers and those based on dispersion of preformed polymers. So we let's talk about dispersion of preformed polymers. In this dispersion of preformed polymers, we have two types. We have the one-step route and the two-step route. The one-step route involves direct formation of nanoparticles without emulsification. And under this one-step route, we have nano precipitation or solvent displacement which is based on the interfacial deposition of the polymer after displacement of the organic solvents from the lipophilic solution to the aqueous phase. And also we have dialysis, which when the poly poly polymer is first dissolved in the organic solvent and is placed inside the dialysis membrane and then displaced against a non-solvent. Also we have super, super critical fluid pathology, which are further divided into uh, RBSS and RSOLV, rest and result. 
in this uh, in between the two, though they are different, but the first difference is that I one is releasing to the ambient and one is releasing to a liquid solvent at the present. So this is this two-step route which involves preparation of emulsification system followed by the formation of nanoparticles, which is different from the one route system. And indeed, we have uh, two types. We have three types, actually. The solvent evaporation and solvent diffusion. In solvent evaporation, the polymer is dissolved in a volatile solvent. The organic solution is emulsified either by single emulsion or double emulsion. And the mixing is processed by a surfactant followed by mineralization yielding a dispersion of nanodrops. Uh, the polymer solvent is then evaporated to form nanoparticles. The second uh, type of the thermal method under two step round is solvent diffusion. Here, a partially water miscible solvent containing the polymer and an aqueous solution containing a surfactant yield uh, the formation of all water emulsion. Solvent diffusion from the dispersed droplets into the external phase is induced by sequential dilution with an extensive amount of water, resulting in collagen formation. Also, we have reverse salting out. Here, an emulsion is formulated from a water soluble polymer, such as acetone, and an aqueous gel containing the salting out agent, for instance, in this instance, calcium chloride and a collagen. Uh, Stabilizer, which at the end of the day, uh, when purified, you have your uh, PNP, that is polymeric nanoparticle. So the second uh, approach is polymerization of monomer, which uh, involves conventional emulsion, uh, which involves emulsion polymerization, which further divided into conventional emulsion polymerization and surfactant-free emulsion polymerization. Then polymeric essential nanoparticle. As we have said earlier that uh, the essential oils are very active and are very volatile. And they still need more use apart from inhalation, massage, and the rest. We should be able to repurpose these uh, essential oils to serve as uh, good agents in treating diseases. And using polymeric uh, nanoparticles will really give us uh, organ-specific treatment that you will be sure that okay, you are using for this treatment and you will go to the organ. Okay. All right, all right, all right, I understand. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to rush, you know. So, polymer and particles are sub-microns. Let's just continue like this. Nanoparticles prepared from pharmaceutically approved synthetic polymers, such as polyethylene glycol, poly uh, polylactic acid, polyaprolactone, polyvinyl alcohol, and their responsive copolymers, co among other, are used as delivery system of essential oils. PAG is a polyether uh, compound generated from petroleum and, in, and that comes in a wide range of molecular weights and is used in various industrial applications. And this PDG has been also used as a uh, medium for delivering essential uh, as nanoparticles. So we have several studies that have reported the use of these polymers as a delivery system for essential oils. In natural polymer essential nanoparticle, we have ketosten, which is the natural polymer derived from the acetylation of chitin. It is a polyacetonic, polycationic uh, macromolecule that is readily functionalized for the targeted delivery of active agents. Polymeric encapsulation of EOs in a ketosan based delivery system is well established in the literature. Ionic deletion with uh, polyphosphate is the most common method for synthesizing ketosan essential particles because it is generally organic solvent free and it's applied in food preservation and uh, delivery of drugs also. And we have several uh, examples or instances where uh, natural materials have been used 
to code essential errors. For instance, a Scratch has been used as PMP to go to, to code uh, to code methane, and which has been used as antioxidant antimicrobial. Also, we have a uh, ketosan which has been used in turmeric essential oil, and uh, yeah, they use it for packaging materials for prolonged third life of uh, surimi, that's an Indian product. So in conclusion, the integration of essential oil into the healthcare delivery system worldwide is increasing and enhance their delivery is of utmost importance. Essential oil used heavily in aromatherapy can be repurposed and their delivery into the patient system is enhanced using other technology. Essential oil are effectively antioxidant, hydrotoxic, ecarotoxia, antimicrobial, anticancerous, and antidepressants. Integrated technology into healthcare delivery system is evolving. It's an evolving area of drug delivery. However, formulating any nano drugs depends on choosing a different polymer system. Essential oils from several medicinal plants have been produced in synthetic polymer nanoparticles which has reportedly increased the efficacy and shelf life of the polymer essential oil nanoparticles. Also, natural polymers have been employed to produce polymer essential oil nanoparticles, increasing, which increases their effectiveness. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Any questions from the audience? No, yes, sir. No question. Thank you, sir, once again for delivering such an informative lecture. Thank you. Uh, I can't simply hear you. I can't hear you. Hello. Are you asking something, sir? I, I couldn't hear what you said very well, that's what I'm asking. Thank you, thank you for your nice lecture. Okay, okay sir, thank you. Now, Dr. Nikesh Kumar Singh, is Dr. Singh ready for his online presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, fine, fine. Now, welcome Dipen Ji. So, Dr. Dipen Kumar Singh is a research scientist at the School of Bioscience and Bioengineering, IIT Mandi. So, welcome Dipen Ji. Please start. Okay, sir. Thank you. <coughs> uh, So my slide is visible? Not yet. The internet is working properly? Yes. Now it's visible. Okay, sir. Can I start? Yes, yes. Okay, Please sir. Start and try to so first I would like to... Okay, sir. Uh, I would like to thank Head of Department Botany Professor Sahna Jamil Mal and Dr. Anki Singh for giving opportunity to present my work in this conference. The topic of my work, the role of environmental chemicals promote proliferation in human androgen receptor positive prostate cancer cell by upregulating the expression of AR and epigenetic regulatory proteins. As I know that audience is already super saturated, so we talk in a very concise and focused manner. So first to be discuss what is endocrine disrupting chemical. Uh, in 2002, World Health Organization uh, giving the definition of endocrine disrupting chemical in the meeting of International Program on Chemical Safety. They describe an endocrine disruptor is an exogenous substance or uh, mixture that alter functions of the endocrine system and consequently cause adverse health effect in an intact organism or its progeny or subpopulation. Here we have showing the snapshot of some common sources of endocrine disrupting chemicals. It 
B can expose by these endocrine disrupting chemical by ATP. ATM received dental sealant holding pass as well as various pharmaceutical drugs like estradiol, various type of phenolic compound like PCB dioxin, uh, cosmetic products, uh, various cosmetics products they containing a bisphenol A and some containing a phthalate like long lasting perfume containing a phthalate. Various type of uh, pesticides they have a potential to interfere with our hormone system. Now, what are the root of exposure of these endocrine disrupting chemicals? We can expose by these endocrine disrupting chemicals by the root of ingestion, inhalation, as well as dermal roots. So now how EDC work? The most important question, how EDC work? In normal condition, hormone bind to their native receptor and give their response. But what happens when they you know, they <coughs> hit by the endocrine disrupting chemical? When they hit by these endocrine disrupting chemicals, they can mimic their function or they block the activity of a receptor. So now we discuss the role of endocrine disrupting chemical in a prostate cancer. So first we discuss the global scenario of a pro prostate cancer. If you look the data of a global plan 2023, then you found that the prostate cancer is the leading cause of incidence approximately 29 percent and it is also a second leading cause of estimated death worldwide and in terms of india in last few years the rate of prostate cancer increased especially in metro cities of india then if you look in this slide then you find that the paradigm shift in the trend of prostate cancer in incidence in last one or two decade researcher think that the prostate cancer is the disease of old age population but uh, blair at all published a paper in cancer in 2020 on the basis of epidemiological studies they found that the prostate cancer affect the population of 15 to 35 year old basically adolescents and young population so they found that now the prostate cancer occurs in the young population as compared to the old age population and the most serious threat is that uh, some people young people diagnosed with the advanced stage of a prostate cancer in their early diagnosis now the etiology of a prostate cancer is poorly in some risk factor like family history race hormone age and diet are established but the role of endocrine disrupting chemical is highly susceptible in case of a prostate cancer metastasis. So first, what the literature suggests? Literature suggests a uh, recent in vitro and in vivo evidences shows that endocrine disrupting chemical has a role in prostate cancer initiation. And some other evidence from the minimal models have shown that early life exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals increase prostate cancer susceptibility. Then other substantial evidence from epidemiological studies indicate that early exposure to EDCs during the developmental stage increased prostate cancer risk. Then now, what is a prostate cancer metastasis? As I told in earlier slide, the initiation and promotion potential of a, these endocrine disrupting chemical in prostate cancer is known. So here we try to check the role of endocrine disrupting chemical in prostate cancer metastasis. So first we try to know what is a metastasis. Especially metastasis is the cancer of stage 4 cancer. Means the cancer have a potential, they gain a potential to migrate from one part of the body to another part. So B, metastasis is major cause of complication and death in prostate cancer. Nearly all men who die from prostate cancer have metastasis. So uh, you can prostate to metastasis is not only involving to the prostate cancer it is a, a stage of almost all cancers so bone is the primary site of prostate cancer metastasis and other sites are like lymph node lungs and liver so the most important thing is that androgen receptor signaling in altering prostate cancer metastasis Especially androgen receptor signaling is regulated by the hormones, so it involves into the development and organizations of a prostate tissue as well as it involves into the each and every stage of a prostate cancer development. Clinical clinicians 
also targeting the androgen receptor to develop a therapy against the hormones so what we think basically we hypothesize that the role of endocrine disrupting chemical in metastasis of a prostate cancer because after the metastasis the overall survival of a patient is only 16 to 18 months here i found that the role of endocrine disrupting chemical is established in growth and organogenesis means endocrine disrupting chemical involves into affect the growth and organogenesis reduce the sperm count and so many demerits in prostate tissue but the role of these edc means endocrine disrupting chemical is metastasis is poorly known so regarding this we have a following experimental plan we have a two tier experimental plan one is in silver screening and another one is self exclusive phase reporter is here for in silver screening we have taken a 50 estrogenic compound because the estrogenicity of endocrine disrupting chemical is well known or well explored explored then further we validated our in silico study with selves rusip this reporter as we have chosen an mda kv2 which is a uh, stably transfected cell line which constitutively express the androgen receptor then first is growing into 2.5% charcoal extracted aps media then exposed with the different dinobiotic chemicals and then we found the endogenic and anti endogenic potential of the genobiotic compound with the help of luciferase reporter assay so this is the 2d snapshot of the edc interacting with androgen receptor ligand binding domain uh, here we clear that the ligand binding domain are the those region where the hormone binds to which paper within 5 minutes please conclude we are running short of time Oh, okay sir then this is the out of 50 estrogenic endocrine disrupting chemical we found that a 50 found to be mimic androgen potential as nanomolar concentration so these are the agonistic endocrine disrupting chemical like a benzoalpha pyrene benzo pyrene and dichlorovastigenistin and beta androsulfan we found that expression of oh, we found the highest level at 50 nanomolar concentration and few have a anti androgenic potential so far our further study we will choose an androgenic edc so first we check that the these edcs have directly interfered with the androgen receptor signaling or it have a role in other cell lines so we check into the pc3 cell line which have no endogen receptor and we found that it selectively target the androgen receptor so then we check the effect of these edcs on ar protein in lnk cells then we found that it is approximately enhance the 1.5 1.8 fold protein expression of the androgen receptor further we check it by the confocal microscopy uh, confocal microscopy when the edc targeting the androgen receptor then then these androgen activated and reached from cytosol to nucleus regarding this we found the significant uh, upregulation of the androgen protein in the nucleus compartment further we check that the these edc only enhance the level of androgen receptor and they also promote the growth of a androgen dependent prostate cancer cells so we performed the growth kinetics and if you look a uh, growth kinetic then you we found that the these compound uh, enhance the growth similar as the dst so dst here we used dst as a positive control then we check the effect of edc on proliferation marker pcna in ln cas cells and we found that it enhance the proliferation at nanomolar concentration similar as the dst further we check that dc genetic regulation in prostate cancer so studies held at a hall at a published a paper in cell and this suggested that the gdc uh, work through the hormonal signaling and few studies also concluded that the gdc work through the epigenetic regulated such as hdf and dnmp so we check that these hormone signaling activated the epigenetic regulator in their downstream regarding this first we check through the in silico screening 
स्पेशली बीच इवन दो जी चीज व्हिच फाउंड अ दे आर पॉजिटिव इन टावर इन सिलिको स्क्रीनिंग देन वी फाउंड दैट दी डीडीसी इंटरैक्ट विद डीएनएमटी वन प्रोटीन देन वी चेक एट द प्रोटीन लेवल विद द हेल्प ऑफ अ बेस्ट ब्लॉटिंग एंड इफ यू लुक देन यू फाउंड दैट दी डीडीसी इन हेल्प द प्रोटीन एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ डीएनएमटी बट नो इफेक्ट ऑन डीएसटी वन डीएसटी so what we conclude that further we check the interaction between d g d c and at the one protein and this is a 2d snapshot in silico interaction of e d c is specific further we check the effect of e d c on h t l protein and l n five cells so if here you look that here e d c in an the level of h t l similar to our positive control that is dst1 further we check that these epigenetic regulators work in influence of hormone signaling regarding this we check the level of h dac1 where inhibiting the level of androgen receptor signaling by using a flutamide uh, flutamide is a well known pharmacological inhibitor of androgen receptor signaling then we found that when we suppress the level of They are protein by flutamide also inhibit the H D F one group. So here we concluded that uh, androgen receptor signaling these endocrine disrupting chemical function through the endo, altering the uh, expression of androgen receptor signaling and they also can work in, independently by activating the epigenetic regulator or. Work through the contact of the androgen signaling like H D F one and enhance the proliferation in L N five cells. So, what we conclude in our study, we concluded that nanomolar concentration of benzoyl alpha pyrimidine dichloroacetate genistein and beta into sulfan significantly mimic the androgen receptor. And we also found that these E D C s selectively enhance the proliferation of androgen dependent L N five cell at nanomolar concentration. So. Nanomolar concentration of these EDCs enhance the expression of epigenetic proteins such as DNMT and HDAC1 LN capsules. So these are paper published in last five years. Then I would like to acknowledge Dr. Rajinis Giri, IIT Mandi, Machal Pradesh, Dr. Neha Gar, Assistant Professor IMS BHU, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, Senior Scientist, CSIR IIT Lucknow, Dr. Yogeshwar Sukla. Chief Scientist CSIR IIT Lucknow, Dr. Alok Kumar Singh, and Dr. Anand Kumar Singh CSIR ISBT Palampur. I would like to again thank to Dr. Sa oh Professor Sahna Jamil Ma'am and Dr. Anki Singh for inviting me in this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there is no question, thank you, sir. So once again, thank you, and we shall look for the next thing. Thank you sir.
30 by 7 is the fourth panel. Uh, you can see that they survive the acute heat stress. That, that when we get the heat stress of 42 degrees Celsius, they even survive that. While the control plants as well as the GF7-3 or the 28-3, in which there was no, no over-expression of this SS2 panel, they just died off and, the, uh, and they just withered off. While the in, in constitutive lines or the inducible lines, the better performance was shown by the inducible lines. By the constitutive lines, this way, Lagatar production ho raha tha, HSP 101 ka. Uh, the system does not require that much of HSP 101 consistently because it is basically a niche of protein. That is induced mainly when there is requirement of the folding of the proteins in the native states when they when they get degraded by the heat stress. So, constitutive production of the HSP 101 also did not help the plant much, uh, 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 much compared to what the inducible when there was heat stress, the plants performed better as compared to the constitutively induced plant. So, the result was that the best performance was the GF plants which had the native promoter as well as the native over expression gene. So, the just change, the just change in one gene that is ATHSP101 over expression can, can provide a heat tolerance to this adaptation. But we have also checked this with other systems also that rice and uh, right now tomato is being also got for, for the transgenic for the tomato. What is innovative? So this was uh, used by the, this what we did in our lab was the transformation technique. But the most advanced form of technique the, that is nowadays, that is the era that is being used is the genome editing tool. The genome editing tool uh, works on the nucleases that majorly create the double stranded breaks into the, the genomic DNA and the fragments of the choice is being inserted and this repair can be then done by the homologous or the non homologous repair mechanism of the cell itself. So the genome editing tool of the, uh, that is the, uh, the first step up was the development of the main finger nucleases by the talent that is the transcription activator like effector nucleases and the most advanced is the CRISPR Cas technology that is this CRISPR Cas technology is was discovered in the E. coli and the E. coli uses the CRISPR mechanism for its uh, for its uh, protection against the bacteriophages. These are the cluster regulatory infer interspace short palindromic sequences in which there is repeat sequences followed by the spacer sequences of the DNA and we can insert our genome interest in these spacer, spacer uh, sequences that is present, is present in between the repeats. So uh, this picture represents the ZFS in which there, there is a ring finger DNA binding, ring finger nucleases accompanied by a nucleus that makes the double uh, strand breakage and we can, uh, we can insert our genome choice. By the talents also uh, similarly works work upon the same technique by making the mix into the strand and then introducing the or making whatever the edits we want to make in the genome that can be done. While the, uh, the CRISPR Cas technology uh, has uh, has uh, some other features like there is a guide DNA also called as a gill DNA which has the tracer RNA as well as the cRNA sequences which are the complementary RNA sequences to the target DNA. Okay, the DNA that we want to target for the changes we create we we and we take the Cas9 which is a type two which is a type two form of the um, of the endonuclease that is utilized so that that is why this technology is called as the CRISPR Cas9 technology and then it uh, it is the RNA is complementary to the DNA sequences that we want to edit into that it, uh, and the nuclease makes the mix and then joins it with the sequences that we require. So many of the plants have been developed by using this development uh, in which they are they are proposed in Aramidopsis, Nicosiana, Mage, Petunia, Soyabean has been uh, worked upon this by using the Tanis technology we have Aramidopsis, Nicosiana, uh, rape seed, sugar cane has been also modified using this technique. The CRISPR Cas technique is the most advanced technique which utilizes the trans activating cRNA as well as the free cRNA which binds to the complementary sequences and Cas9 protein is for the cleavage of the complementary target region of the DNA. And the CRISPR Cas system has been reported to it is the advanced technique and the, uh, even the scientists that developed uh, into it, the, the Brassica, they all they just uh, do to make, take out the fear from the, the general public that this is some technique which is, which is doing some modification. They themselves made that, uh, that classified species and they aim in the front of media that there is, uh, there is no there, there is no problem that is going to, uh, to happen if people are using this crystal cast technique. And sir has very nicely explained the crystal cast technique of this, uh, when it was developed and how it works. So, uh, what this is the mechanism that I have already explained about the CRISPR-Cas technique and this, uh, that, uh, the, there is uh, uh, one uh, controversy, not rather controversy, there is always 
is the checkpoint that this is the better technology that is being used. It is the ZF hatch or the talent or the CRISPR CAS technology. So the feasibility of ZF hatch is very difficult and the targeting, the secret targets of ZF hatch is also comparatively poor rather than your talent or the CRISPR man. So the best type of genome editing tool that has been found is the CRISPR CAS technology that is based on the RNA DNA Watson based pairing as well as the uh, it, you only need to change the 20 unit type change is only required and its targeting is the best and it is very easily or this feasibility is also very high you can repeat this technique multiple of times okay so this was one of the best aspects of the you know uh, what are the gmos this is the always pros and cons of the other country that she has to start in the party of the head right so now I am going to focus about what are the socio-ethical concerns. See, yes, GM say my productivity comes up here, the plant is more, more drought resistant, more climate, climate resistant, resilient, or we do not want to stay at the herbicide in the plant. But this has also some very drastic effect that people has, the uh, uh, which it has, uh, it, it has uh, the GM crop has, has been opposed by many of the government, many of the thinkers, farmers, groups, and many of the NGOs, they,
only that the crop that has been uh, that has been uh, uh, that has been given the permission to for the commercial uh, commercial production in the year quarter uh, only of the duty quarter what we know commonly. Recently, government made a clearance we had to the the uh, the brassica species brassica to uh, uh, to, to uh, recently BMH11 variety to have that is the Dhara mustard hybrid variety को अभी clearance दिया गया है but वो बहुत ज़्यादा number four case चला है वो जब तक पहले तो भी the deeper mental of university और Delhi but बहुत सारी चीजों के बाद right now अभी इन्हें बोला क्या है क्योंकि we will try to uh, to introduce this uh, master variety into the Indian market. And there are six competent authorities that are working at different levels. There is state, district as well as state level authorities which see the what is happening at the state or district level. While the uh, decompetent DNA advisory committee that gives advices regarding the GM uh, GM crops good or not. While review committee, genetic engineering, appraisal committee is mainly the committee that gives the budget is under the Ministry of Environment and Forest that gives the permission so that it can be grown in India or not. So these are majorly these three are majorly the regulatory committees of India. There are some people uh, or the activists which always say against the geo human crop. You might also listen to the, to the lady Vandana Shiva. She also appeared in the Satyamev Chaitanya ka jo program hua tha. Usme bhi aayi thi aur unhone kafi kuch bola tha about the GM crops. The GM crop uh, there was a cry against it. The GM crops achhi nahi hai. They are going to uh, they will have the biosecurity issues and she also battles for the Bird seed to leave them in natural form. You don't need to modify the seeds that we that we get in the nat natural form. And she also fights against the rights of farmer. The farmer who wants to seed farming to bring it, or you will make India even more poorer. This is the second plan that that has that strictly opposes the use of the GMOs in India. Dr. Ashwini Mahajan, who is a professor in PGDAB, as on also the spokesperson as the convener of the India Swadeshi Jagran Man. So he says that. It is a dangerous and unneeded GM mustard. So, I mean, this is the bad thing. He said that he had an interview with him. He said that he had an interview with him. It is a completely unneeded crop. We don't need this crop and it is not so desi. This may be a part of the other companies. They will have to buy pesticides. They will have to buy a lot of pesticides. So, we will not be benefited by this crop. Rather, we will be in the harm also. And he also says that there, there will be occupation of the beekeepers as well as the farmers will also be affected by this. By the business standard in report IT, just ne bola hai ki India me India me abhi 13 crops ke upar are deeply suggested, are deeply engaged in the uh, in the production of these 13 new development of the GM crops and. Government is also emphasizing for the for the development of new new GM crops so that the market productivity of these crops can be enhanced. This was also uh, appeared in the main in the October 2022 when there was clearance and clearance. And we have a book. Uh, I am also one of the editor of the book that we published in 20. Uh, 21 rather. This is the policy issues in genetically modified crops. This is quite a comprehensive book. Uh, in which uh, we have editors from different backgrounds, uh, Dr. Pradeep Singh and uh, Dr. Shitin Singh is uh, assistant professor in the University of Delhi, while Anvesha Gorda is the uh, visiting Marie Curie fellow, uh, and while um, this Ajay Kumar is, is placed in ARO, International ARO Organization Israel. So we combined a book, rather we edited a book, in which we have talked about the different aspects of these GM crops, which has many of the, this is, this is a book cover, uh, and uh, we have, it, um, it, it takes five dimensions of the GM crops in which the, what are the policies and the politics against the genetically modified crops, which has, uh, the whole book has 23 chapters, which we have divided into the five sections. The section number one, one focuses on the policies and the politics that is being organized, that is, Behind this, the release of GMOs or not, and it talks in the different countries. We have aspects. We have the chapters on Russia, we have the chapters on Turkey, even US, and also the policy that is being done in India. The second section is genetically modified crops and the global food security solution. That how they are going to be, uh, they are going to, um, uh, they are going to, um, to contribute to the sustainable agriculture in India. That undernourished the world, the African countries, so they have to be in the this genetically modified crops and the sustainability in the, in the agriculture. While the food 
fourth unit uh, session focuses on the genetically modified food and the social ethical issues. So, now I have told you many social ethical issues. In this, it has been comprehensively in each chapter dealt with. That what are the the social aspect of the concern that we actually need to know before even the consumption, before even the varieties being released and before consumption, we need to get a thought enough to tell you before consumption of these GMOs. While the technical advancement, the many techniques we have discussed, the the development challenge, so the physical care, yeah, even the transformation technique, this way we see these GMOs go, where they are made. So uh, if somebody is interested, uh, you may read this book and you uh, you will have a holistic knowledge regarding the both pros as well as the cons of these genetically modified crops. So just let me conclude what uh, uh, what I just said. As the global population is expected to reach the 9 trillion by 2050. These GMO crops are expected to add profit for the commercial agriculture. The GMO crops have provided plant biotechnologists with a strong opinion to move the need for global food security and the application of biotechnological tools that is yet a different challenge for the fiscal care are the new emerging technologies which are being used for the genome editing. With a view of improving the dietary complement in the staple crops, there has been development of the golden rice, maize, or the canola varieties which has the enhanced tomato, uh, sorry, vitamin A concentration or the tomato with increased uh, cell life or the folic acid. And genetic engineering has given us insect resistant crops, herbicides, or the plants which have changed the global net production as well as the market. However, the food security is of paramount importance. Hamisha, it is very important and should be strictly regulated and the GM crop should be evaluated before their release. And it should be ensured that the food safety measures and the protocol should be given in accordance with the scientific facts as well as the basis. So thank you very much for very much patiently listening to my talk. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the platform to uh, show my work and to talk about the GM. Thank you, Allah. We do have questions. But that will be interesting at the conference. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. This book is online available to share to the department. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. This is online available. As well as I also have got a hard copy. If somebody is interested, they can see the book. And this is also available in Amazon or Flipkart. If you call media price page, somebody wants to buy this book. You can just order. Yeah. And you can share the soft copy also. If anybody okay. requires, you can soft copy.
सांप का जहर पिएंगे तो मरेंगे या नहीं मरेंगे नहीं मरेंगे ये साइंटिस्ट नहीं मरेंगे सांप का जहर सांप के जहर को उतारने के लिए इंजेक्ट किया जाता है हम दौड़ रहे हैं और इस जगह से साइंटिस्ट को भी नहीं चाहिए नहीं चाहिए मैं मैं नहीं बोल रहा क्यों नो 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 पी सी के मैं पेपर है कि वो लोग नहीं कर सकते वी कैन डाइजेस्ट वी कैन डाइजेस्ट माइंड अप एंड वी शुड हैव डिस्कशन विद लंच टाइम प्लीज सो टॉक्सिक सी सी की वो क्या टॉक्सिक टू ह्यूमन बीइंग एंड इट इज बेटर दैट यू मस्ट टॉक टू मेनी आफ्टर यस सो आई एम आई एम प्रमोटर ऑफ ये हो